spoilers for episode seven. I've reviewed the other six. They're in a playlist down in the description below. Now, episode seven was a vast improvement on episode six. I was going to play that off deadpan. Didn't really work. Well, in this episode, we find out that Rand is actually the Dragon Reborn. Of course, we only find that crammed into the last three minutes of the episode because we spend the rest of it trying to work out which of the five is boinking which of the others. In fact, by the end of it, I began to wonder if Raph was right and the multi-headed dragon simply referred to Rand's naughty bits and the Dragon Reborn really had been inside the five of them since the start. And Wheel of Time Twitter was really hitting us with the tough questions this week. What do we call these two? Randween? Egg Wand? Something else? Let us know in the comments below. And I think I gave them the most accurate answer, actually. Fan fiction. It's really the only thing they are. Let's face it, it's not the answer they wanted, but it is the answer they deserved. And on Sunday, Twitch actually banned Amazon Prime Video. I can only assume someone there wasn't happy with the Rand reveal. And I can assure you, I do not work at Twitch. What's funnier though is that Amazon actually owns Twitch itself, so you know your property is really bad when you start banning your own company. <laughs> and look, me and Raf, we have a lot in common. My audience used to be 2% women, but since I started talking about the Wheel of Time, that's risen to an astonishing 7.2%. And Raf, well, we all know what Raf identifies as. So I think we all could agree that both of us, we are very, very well placed to talk about women's issues. And I just want to point out that this tweet wasn't here last week, but um, I think we can all say that that really nails the opinion of uh, every sane person at this point. So look, I don't want to hear it anymore. None of the excuses, none of the whining. Certainly none of this, oh, I think you should give me a seat on the bus because it's so difficult and tiring growing a life inside of me. No, we're not accepting that anymore because I've got video evidence that it's actually not that difficult at all. When a woman who's nine months pregnant can just fly around and basically take on an entire army on her own and then give birth in two squeezes without even the slightest bit of pain, I think that practically everyone can stand up and walk on their own. You don't need any help. No, you certainly don't need nine months off afterwards. I don't know what all the problem is. And look, I know that and Raph knows that. And when Raph identifies as one of those, that is a man who definitely knows what he's talking about. And I don't want to hear any of you disagreeing because I have facts, hard data that proves that this man is is a genius, a creative genius, that just everything he touches turns to gold. Look at this. How can you disagree with this chart? This is hard facts, and facts and data and logic are the way we win the war. Look, the United States TV demand versus market average digital originals only. But look, it's at the top of the chart and it says 41.7x. Just look at it. Look at it. It proves everything. Of course, I had no idea what TV demand versus market average digital original only's meant. So I had to go and look it up. And when I went to look it up, I think we could all agree that this, this is just hard facts. Because you see, Amazon, they don't actually give anything like actual viewers of a show. And so I don't know where they got that entire chart for. And I didn't need to because this actually answers it all for me in perfectly accurate terminology that I completely know what the transparently they're measuring. You see, they don't use estimates or surveys. They report the total market demand expressed for each show in each country exactly as captured by our system. You don't have to question this. It's exact. It even uses the word right there. Our collection system captures billions of points of new data, things from hashtags, liking and sharing, research actions like reading about the shows, writing about the shows. I mean, ob obviously anyone that actually responds to a hashtag or liking or writing about it, it can only be good. That's, 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 can, that can only be a good sign. I mean, look, they filter out the noise and work out which it is so they only get the buzz. Yeah, these take all of these datas and then just arbitrarily weight them and combine them. Look, it literally says right there what it is. And I think we can all agree that that's just some magic bullshit. No, 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 this has to be accurate. It has to be accurate because they get their information from such well-respected peer-reviewed sources like social video sites, blogs, and micro-blogging sites. Well, I think we can all agree that that completely satisfies it. What these people do is they go to micro-blogging sites, get some random signals, work out which way they want to multiply it to get the results they want, and then um, report that as fact. Now, I think we can all agree that that is a very transparent and scientific way of determining that chart, and that none of us can disagree with its results. But I didn't just want to take it at face value, so I went undercover. And I can give you exclusive hidden camera footage of the people at Parrot Analytics working out the rankings of that chart. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. 
Now, even though I would never disagree with such a factual place as Paris Analytics, I would like to point out that the Google trend data for Wheel of Time, which includes interest in the books, by the way, actually peaked about three weeks ago, at, so it'll be 100%. And since those three weeks, we're now down at 48%. We've lost over half of the interest in the show, half of the people and the search traffic. I know what Paris Analytics is actually tracking, but... Um, it doesn't look the best to me. And look, I'm not saying that Wheel of Time doesn't have a lot of viewers. I'm not even saying it doesn't have enough for a third series or however many it needs to go. What I am saying is that losing half of your interest in three weeks probably isn't the best thing for the show. Now, I've always said this show was never a bait and switch. It was very obvious if you actually looked at all of the interviews and everything else, exactly what was going to happen to this show. Raph was always honest about the changes he was going to make to this show. But one thing I never expected them to do would be to be so honest about it inside the show itself. Because this time, even in the intro themselves, that they decided to actually include the entire worst line of the last episode, so I was very impressed that for this, they really wanted to show and prepare the viewers for the exact amount of trash that was going to come in this episode. We've all heard of the ways and stories, but none of us know what they are. That line was an abomination in the last episode, and it was so good, they showed it twice. Yes. Now, any women out there, if you've not popped out a sprog yet, don't worry about it, because I've got video evidence that really, it's actually no problem at all, because this is a very heavily pregnant woman. And when I say very heavily pregnant, I mean literally giving birth uh yeah she's got blood on her spear she's been fighting her veil is up that's how you know she's been fighting the aiel always have their veils and when fighting so i like it so far it's a bit weird that her armor actually has space for the baby bump i don't know why the aiel would actually design armor for pregnant women it seems a, a little odd now i want to say at the start i am very lenient when it comes to fight scenes and the magic because i like action scenes and i think the magic cgi looks good so uh, I actually don't have a problem with a lot of this, except for a few major, major parts of it. And um, I think you can see one of them right here on the screen, but here we are. Now she's running along at an all right pace for someone who's literally giving birth. And as you can see on this entire picture, there is no one behind her. Not a single person is chasing her. We hear voices in the distance, but there is no one there. And she runs behind the rock that you've just seen. This has taken literal seconds. And she checks over the rock to make sure there's no one following her. And there's no one there. We can now see over her shoulder. There's no one there. She's checked. She's removed her veil because she's in no danger. She's not going to be fighting. When Aiel fight, they always have their veils raised. That's how you know they're about to engage in violence. So the fact that she's lowered it means she knows she's safe and she's not going to need it. She's checked over that rock. There's no one there. And suddenly there's a sword attacking her. I don't know where he came from. I don't know how it's possible. It's literally not possible. She checked behind her multiple times. Let sat down for three seconds. And this guy is teleported out of nowhere to suddenly attack her out of the blue. Look, I know a lot of people will be like, well, I have a problem because she's pregnant. At that point, I don't even care about at this point. Where did that guy come from? Where did this sword come from? And she's lowered her veil because she knew she was safe when there was no one there. Does this guy have a cloak of invillability or something? Look, I don't mind the action as such, but there are limits, and there are limits, and this is one. So she springs into action. She's pregnant, but she has a spear with her. Hasn't raised a veil. Hasn't raised, like, literally what the Aiel are literally known for. In fact, there's even places in the books where people are like, when did they raise their veil? Like, nobody knows because it just happens. So this is what would happen here. It would be up in an instant. They practiced for this. This is part of their culture. It's never not done. But what we're about to see is an Aiel fight and kill with no veil. And the only time she's had a veil is when she was in absolutely no danger whatsoever and there was no one there. Literally the opposite of what Aiel are actually like. What are the foundational principles of their culture and their sort of warrior practices? And you've already taught everyone the exact wrong thing. But very heavily pregnant and using this little stick, she hits his leg and he knocks him over and he rolls away. So at this point, there's a lull in the fighting. There's all the time she needs to raise her veil. There is no excuse from this time forwards that she just didn't have time to do it. Because you can see how far he is away. And if anyone's going, oh, but she's in labor, then yes. Okay, if you want to use the labor excuse that she can't raise her veil, then what she certainly couldn't do is fight with it. We're going to have to pick one of the excuses at this point. And for me, 
this is the perfect freeze frame. As I say, I'm very lenient in fighting, but even I saw this and thought this is absolutely ridiculous. And what's worse is it's done in slow motion, which makes it all obvious. If you're going to do something bad, don't do it in slow motion. But here she is, she's running. You can very clearly see what side she is on. Everybody knows where she's about to run. She's got her arm held out, so everyone knows what she's about to do. And this guy's sword is in the perfect position to swing. And I thought he was just going to swing like that and she was going to grab his arm or something. But no, he moves his arm from a sort of a swing ready position into an overhead hit position and then goes to swing, obviously where she isn't. It's in slow motion, dude. I can't ignore something like this when you do it in slow motion. And you only do it for the next scene, which I think makes this worse. Because I don't think any of this was needed, and you could have just set up the next bit in a decent way. And look, I know a lot of people are going to have a problem with this. I actually think this looks cool. And like I say, I'm a sucker for stuff like this. I really like fight scenes. I don't really care whether, oh, it's actually humanly possible or anything like that. I think it's fine. My problem is that she's literally giving birth to her it but for all the choreography and the moves and everything else i think it's fine i like action scenes you're just gonna have to forgive me if you've got a problem with them because i think that flip over and then this move is actually really cool and i only care if it looks cool my biggest issue is that we keep seeing this massive bump on her stomach and it's just like no that is the problem with this and look as i've said ladies if she can do all this with that massive bump then i don't want to hear any more excuses online or on tv about how women have it so hard because it turns out that actually you can just do everything with it it's fine actually when i said i didn't have any problem with the rest i forgot the next bit that happens you see another guy comes up and she spears him and it's like okay then his mate comes up and goes to actually throw something at her and she spins the guy around to block the thrown dagger fine fine that makes sense when i describe it to you firstly throwing it that distance it's going to have lost a lot of its force she literally turns the guy around and it goes through it goes into his plate armor full plate armor and it goes through from a thrown dagger at that distance and i don't know anything about this stuff and i'm thinking oh my god that's really stupid <laughs> and the issue is I don't know anything about it. I don't care about that kind of stuff. And it even pulls me out of the series. So more people appear and she goes running at him, even though it looks like she's eaten a person. And she starts deflecting these thrown objects with her spears. I actually think that looks really cool. I have no problem with any of this, except the fact that it looks like she's eaten a person. And she goes off and she fights all three of them. And I like it because I'm a real sucker for this stuff. And I have no problem with an Aiel doing this. I think they'd probably be skilled enough to do this. This is kind of fits in with their law, except for the fact that they never did it pregnant. The real biggest issue is that they're desperately trying to go, oh no, but she's really struggling. She's really struggling, but then immediately doesn't struggle whenever she doesn't need to, because this is a whammon, and that means she can do literally anything. She's literally giving birth during all of this, and it's not a problem, because yes, there are times when she's actually in the middle of a fight and just happens to be a lull and she uses those exact moments just to get a few pushes in just to get that baby out a little bit more and then goes immediately back to the fighting like there's literally nothing wrong because women can actually have everything and do everything yes of course you can have your career even if your career just happens to be taking out armies and you can give birth at the same time it's obvious really get a couple of pushes in hold off a couple of men with spears i see this every day it's perfectly normal i just wanted to show this camera angle for comedy reasons and of course she beats all of them which is probably actually realistic for an aiel except for the fact that she's literally giving birth of course she's finally overcome with her final pushes and that allows the man to finally be able to do something but only Actually, when we've already proven that he's actually been defeated and he deals the fatal blow. Not because he actually beat her in any way, shape or form. It was only because there was literally no other chance they made it. So that this woman literally has absolutely no flaws. She's done nothing wrong. She did everything. She still beat all of them. She only lost because the baby's head is first appearing. And as such, he deals the fatal blow. 
<laughs> Never mind, she gets him anyway. And so as she crawls off to finally finish giving birth, which she's actually been doing during the fight all along, um, at no point did she raise her veil at any of those points, uh, which is literally the only thing an Aeel would do in that situation. So um, really sticking to that law there. But there's a problem because she's in the snow and we find out she's actually not too posh to push and a sword appears. And everyone's like, oh no, including myself, because there really is something horrible they could have done at this moment. Because we find out that this is Tam with his heron mark blade, and it would be very, very easy for them to destroy Tam with this story. Because remember, at this point, Tam is the only man which actually hasn't been completely destroyed. His character hasn't been completely destroyed. He's still been allowed to be a good, strong man, which actually got injured protecting his family. He's literally the last one left. Before that, it was also Lan, but we've seen what's happened to Lan the last couple of episodes. So with this, the only way they, the only thing they need to do to actually destroy his character is have him push just like she's doing. But to find out the answer to that, uh, you're gonna have to wait till later in the video. Now that whole scene never needed to happen. We didn't need to see behind the scenes, but we do. And even in that scenario, there was better ways to do it. We didn't need a magical superwoman who can pop out a sprog while taking down 17 different people. It, it makes no sense. Aiel could have fought that. All the entire scene could have worked like that. Uh, just without the pregnant woman actually doing the fighting. All we needed was two Aiel, and then one could be fighting to try and save her, while she's actually down on the floor, unable to do anything except give birth. And it would have made a lot more sense. But instead, we've got to show how great they are. You can do it all is the message there. Well, at least temporarily, because it'll catch up with you eventually and then it'll be the death of you. Raph might actually be using this entire series to secretly subvert messaging. I don't know. I don't know. It's a weird one. Now, we're going back to hell. And I have to say, for this episode, Nineveh and Egwene really switch around. I've always thought that Nineveh was uh, actually the worst character out of all of them, the most annoying person out of the five. But Egwene really, really takes her place in this one. Because Nineveh's like, stop, you have to open it again. We're not leaving without him. And Moraine's like, lol, already have. No, she says he already made his choice. Um, which I guess I'd, he did, but like literally 30 seconds before you gave them a speech about how the apocalypse is going to happen and you don't know who it is because it could be any of them and the entire face of the world rests on all of their shoulders. And now you're just like, yeah, we don't care if it's that one. Uh, we'll just let the world end if it is. Uh, we're not really bothered. So her entire reasoning doesn't make sense. But either way, Moraine's like, he made his choice and Rand's like, did he? Or did you make it for him? Which makes no sense, Rand. I don't know what you're waffling on about. Like, literally, unless you're complying that she did some kind of uh, compulsion on him, then your comment is just a stupid question. But Moraine doesn't answer. She goes, you know the darkness inside him. Because remember, in this fan fiction, uh, Matt's evil. Uh, yeah, Matt's just got loads of evil inside him. The dagger was feeding off that evil, and he was feeding off the dagger. It's not like the dagger was the most evil item in the entire universe or something. No. Matt was the evil, and that's why he got with the dagger. And actually, I made a prediction in the last episode about how they could do that if they really, really wanted to destroy Matt's character. And um, in the future of this episode, they do it. That'll be fun. But Moraine's like, you know the darkness in him better than anybody. I don't know why. I mean, he's been his mate, and he was never evil before, so... What you're saying doesn't make any sense. But when he says, of course, Matt can handle it, she just goes, yeah, we've already wasted too much time and walks off again for the third time in the series. Look, there is parts in the books where she realizes this. The people in the two rivers are very stubborn. So if you push them into something, they'll dig their heels in. But there were times because of that where she thought that the best way to actually get someone to follow her was actually to make it seem like she just didn't care whether they followed or not. But she did it from memory like twice. And we've already had it three times in the series and we're nowhere near as far as all of those times were in the books. And it's getting really old. How whenever she just needs them to do something, she just wanders off and assumes they're going to follow and they do. Uh, literally, can we please, please come up with some kind of different mechanism in the story of why these people are actually following her? Because just her walking off and assuming that they'll follow is really getting quite tired at the moment.
as literally any time there's any conflict, that's all she ever does. Now, I was worried that the group was just going to walk off and leave him and follow Moraine right there, but at least they have a discussion about what they're going to do. And Anita's like, look, we need to open it. We need to open the gate. And Egwene's like, how? We can barely channel. And I want you to remember that the two of them can barely channel. But then Loiel actually chimes in. He says, if you use the one power inside the ways, you'll throw yourself at Majin Shin, so uh, you probably shouldn't open the gate. Now, obviously, if they do open it, they can just exit, but that would mean that they can't get into the borderland, so at least this bit does make sense. Uh, yes, you can channel inside the ways, but if you do, you'll attract it, so you should only really channel at your exit. Of course, you've still got all the problems before that OG can't channel, and so they couldn't use the ways without an AS to die. So why are all these things open and closed with the one power? No, while I was actually writing ways for them to solve the plot holes in their own series, uh, they didn't care. But Loyal's like, look, you can't channel because otherwise Majin Shin will come and he will feast on your soul. Now, in the books, it would literally sort of uh, tear them apart, turn them inside out. It was really not nice. It loved looking at their insides. It's not something you'd want to meet. Uh, but in this, it feasts on your soul. Remember that description as well. All of this is very important for later. Feast on your soul. Just what does that conjure up in your mind? It sounds still really nasty. The other one may exactly play with your body, but this will play with your soul. Consume your soul. Feast upon it. Right. But Nineveh's just like, uh, what's my Jin Shin? And of course, Loyal doesn't even think he needs to answer that. No, why would he? It goes, Moraine Sedai is actually, she's quite a far way off at the moment. Uh, you can still see a light, though, so she can't be that far because light doesn't travel in the ways very far. And OG, <laughs> don't you know, we're slow. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, you're known to be slow for making decisions, but you can, like, run as fast as a horse? That's, that's literally written down. You're not slow moving. You're sort of cautious you you live a long time so you make decisions slowly you act slowly but you can actually run pretty fast so if you make a decision to go over there you'll actually do that quickly because you're 10 foot tall and have long legs and can still run so what they've actually written here is a character that makes a decision really quickly to follow moraine to die um but actually moves really slowly which is exact opposite of what the OG are meant to be. This with the Aiel and the Veil made it the exact opposite of what they were meant to be. I'm kind of sensing a pattern here, but Matt's having none of it. He's learned that something's gonna feast on his soul and there's literally no way to do anything about it. And he's like, oh, but we can't just leave him. And I'm like, dude, if I'd just been told that, I'd probably be like, okay, I'm in bigger danger than him. Um, we should probably do something about this. But rather than just going, yeah, but Rand, uh, there's literally nothing we can do. We can't go that way. We've got to go that way. And staying here, we're all going to get eaten alive. Egwin, oh God. Oh no. Egg she just goes, he didn't, we didn't leave him. He left us. And I'm like, no, actually, you still left him because he just stayed where he was. You guys walked away from him. Uh, so you definitely left him either way. But also, she does not care about Matt at all in this scene. And this is a really common theme of this entire episode. In this episode, we actually do finally get some character development of these people. And what we learn is that Egwene is even more of an annoying, self-centered little cow than we have in the other episodes. Uh, she's horrible. She's really, really horrible. Because she's like, Matt's left us. And Rand goes, you don't actually believe that. And I'm like, no, she clearly does. Uh, I don't know why you don't believe her. If somebody tells you something horrible about themselves, just believe them. Just trust them. Uh, they're probably not going to lie to you about it. And she's like, look, after all of this, no matter what happens, we'll go and find him. We'll come back for him. And I'm like, finally, at least somebody said it. Yes, we don't have any opportunity right now to do anything, but we can always get him later on. The voice of reason. Something I never thought of her before. I would just like to point out at this bit that uh, Rand has the grand total of three arrows in his quiver. Yes, this guy has just come from Tarvalen, one of the most well-equipped places in the entire world. They are so rich they can do anything. They will definitely have fletches that could have made him as many arrows as he wanted. A moraine would have bought all of them. And even though they're going through an incredibly deadly place... He only bought three arrows. Now, Lan and Moraine are discussing Matt, and Lan's like, but 
we can't leave him behind. What if he's the Dragon Reborn? And Moraine's like, well, he had an inherent darkness within the, in him, and the dagger was feeding off him as much as he was off the dagger. Yeah, we're repeating that tripe again. I mean, now, Matt is literally evil. That's how he's being described, completely and utterly evil. Uh, despite the fact that in the two rivers, uh, his mom was clearly on something and his dad, like, cheated on her. But apparently that's enough to turn Matt, like, basically as good as a dark friend. Or worse, because the most evil thing in the universe actually can feed off him. There's that much darkness inside him that finds enough food. It's completely and utterly insane. Has absolutely nothing to do with that dagger. The dagger turned people evil and it infected other people. Didn't matter whether you were good or bad, it worked all the same on all of them and it wasn't their fault. But in this, no, it was all Matt's fault. All of it was Matt's fault. But of course, it doesn't stop Lan because Lan's like, yeah, okay, so he might have been, or he might have been like one of the most evil people in the world, apparently. Uh, but what actually if he is the Dragon Reborn? Anyway, and Moraine's like, well, you know, uh, if he was that evil, then I couldn't actually have him go and f confront the Dark One, uh, because if he did, then he would turn to his side, and I will do anything but let him turn to his side. I'm like, uh, okay, kind of makes sense. But the issue you've got there is that basically none of Matt's darkness, as she calls it, was ever his fault, because where did it come from? This is a guy who's been in a very enclosed little town, and his parents aren't his responsibility. He didn't come up with his parents. The wheel did. The wheel put him in that situation. The wheel gave him all of those circumstances, which would have gave him that darkness. The wheel actually would have set him up to fail if this is Moraine's theory, and none of it really works out that way. Like, you could have actually spun this story better if you just had the dagger infecting him, but now you've got that the dagger is Matt's fault. It's horrible. She even goes to the fact that he was drawn to the dagger because of his darkness. And I actually said that in the last episode, that that's how they could set this up. I said that as if they really shouldn't do this. And then the next episode is like they've listened to me and gone ahead and done it. Oh, it's amazing. All you have to do for this show is literally predict the worst story arc, and that's the one that goes down. Whatever shows the men in the worst light, that's what they're going to do. And I'm really not sure that it puts the, the wheel in a good state in this. Like, literally, it set him up to fail. It deliberately made the dragon evil. It's like it wants to break itself at this point. That's the message you're sending with this. And the worst thing is that Moraine actually goes, uh, we can't let him in because I already know what choice he'd make. I already know that he would turn. It's not like, oh, well, he might turn. No, he definitely will. And now she's making concrete conclusions about Matt and his character for the future. And while, yes, the old actor may not be part of it anymore, he is coming back into the story. So now we're going to have to come up with some kind of not only a redemption arc, but someone's going to have to intervene because we know that Matt has darkness within him. We know that it's actually not from the dagger. It was always there. And we know that that darkness on its own, because he's been completely cured, will, al will already make him turn to the dark side. So at this point, whether he's the dragon or not, they're going to have to come up with some kind of reason, some external reason of why he's going to change. And um, we actually find out from Moraine's plans who's probably going to make that happen, and I'm not looking forward to any of it. Now we get to see the ways for the first time. It's dark, in torchlight, at least that's accurate. Uh, none of this is how I imagined it. I went and looked up some other images that other people drew, and, um, and this isn't how they envisaged it either. Another camera angle. Look, one path. Couldn't you at least have showed us one bit? Even if it was impossible for him to walk down, we could have at least seen another path at some point. I have to say, at this point, I thought it was actually improving as an episode, mainly due to the sound effects. I thought the sound effects and sound design of this area was actually done really well. It does build suspense. I don't think any of it's really the visuals on the screen. I think it is all sound, but I'm fine with that. Um, I even began to start liking the episode at this point. That didn't last long. It's time for the fan service because, like we get in every episode, this is like the one tiny section of the books which is actually represented on the screen. Yeah, everything else may be fantasy and made up and completely just nonsense, but every episode they like to at least put in one line from the books. Loyal says every corner used to have fruit trees on it. It was all green and covered in grass. It was beautiful. But now all that remains is these pockmarked stones where one step will send you tumbling into the void, or worse. 
And I hope you enjoyed that section from the books because that's all you're going to get. That is literally the beginning and the end of everything from the source material in this entire episode. So I hope you enjoyed it because that's the only quality you're going to get. And it's all downhill from here. Because Egwin goes, there's something worse than plumbing it into a void forever. And Loyal goes, oh yes, I can think of a few things. And Rand's like, it's all right. You don't have to talk about him. You don't have to scare me. I'm only a man. Please, for the love of God, don't scare me. And I'm like, hang on. He's just told you that there. you can also plummet into a void. And there are at least three things worse than that in here that you should probably be careful of. And you're like, yeah, mate, we don't need to hear that. If something dangerous was lurking for me in every corner and a guy's like, I'm literally going to tell you what all of the dangers in this place are. I'd be like, yeah, please tell me. And if you can kind of give up some way I can outplay it and survive. That'd be really useful, thanks. But not Rand. Not Rand, no. Rand's too scared. Rand's too scared to actually take basic survival advice. Instead, he'd just rather remain ignorant and fall off a cliff somewhere. Here's a brightly lit section of the entire path, and it's still one path with no offshoots that lead anywhere. I mean, seriously, this is meant to lead to multiple areas. It's meant to lead to many gates. How are you supposed to get to many gates? Please, please, somebody inform me. Lan starts flirting with Neve. She's like, oh, I owe Moraine three silvers. Uh, you were scowling, I bet, on pouting. Firstly, Neve has never pouted in this entire episode. I'm not even sure she scowled. I mean, the description that I would have used for most of the expressions throughout this has been a face like a slapped arse. Uh, but maybe that's just me. But then at least good guy Lanny knows that she's meant to be worrying about her five. That is literally supposed to be the only reason she actually came with them in the first place. And he's like, look, Matt's safer there than in here. Uh, yeah, we're all probably gonna die. He didn't enter the really, really dangerous ways. So while Moraine's going, oh, he's evil, that's why he didn't come, uh, Lan's just like, yeah, that guy's actually the smart one out of the group. So, um, kind of like Lan in this scene. Now Perrin at the back of the group goes, wait, everybody, there's something in front of us. And at this point, directions become very important because nobody else seems to understand how directions work. Especially Moraine. They see one of the guiding stones, and this is in Ogier Tong, and so they actually needed Loyal to actually go through and read it so they can show all the directions. This is on all of the different intersections, because anyone in there could very easily get lost, and so these were there to tell them all the pathways. As the pathways were grown, the stones were put in so everyone knew where to go, and this is why it was meant for Ogier, so it's in Ogier script. Except, as you can see, this one has very clearly been defaced with big, massive gaps carved into it. You see, Loyal's like, no Ogier would destroy this. No one wants to get lost. It's almost like something is trying to destroy the Guiding Stone so that people can't find their way through. And Moraine's like, can you still read it? And he's like, yes. Uh, but I'm gonna need your patience. And there is a funny little comment next from Rand who's like, look, if an Ogi is asking for patience, this is going to take a very long time. It's not like anyone else just saying, oh, you know, it'll be five minutes. If an Ogi asks for patience, you might be there for five years. Nobody knows. But what comes next is literally, I don't know how this actually even gets through script writers, let alone anything else. Can't you even keep directions in your mind? You see, Lan walks up to Moraine and he goes, do you know what happened to the guiding? And she goes, no. And then he turns around and goes, there's something following us. Yeah, that makes total sense. You're walking along a one-way path. The person behind you sees a thing in front of you that is already destroyed before you got there. And by finding out that something is destroyed in front of you, you think there's something behind you. So Lan's theory is literally that they entered the ways. Something followed them into the ways, skipped around from behind them to in front of them destroyed the guiding in front of them, and then teleported back behind them so it can start following them again. I mean, that is some of the most five-head 4G chess logic that I have ever heard. I'm just really glad those two walked off to have that conversation on their own, because they, if they had that conversation around anyone else who had an IQ above the temperature of freezing, then, um... I really would have wanted to bring up that really obvious plot point. But as it is, Rand just turns to Perrin and goes, how did you even see that? And Perrin's like, I don't know. Well done, Perrin. Well done. You are really smart. Thank you. Uh, look, Perrin isn't stupid. He's just slow to make a decision about something because he wants it to be the right decision. He's cautious, not thick. And it would be weird for him to say, I don't know anyway, because you don't question your own senses. You more assume everyone else has the same senses. If you're in a room with someone and you see something in that room, you assume they can see it as well. So he should have just been more like, what do you mean? How did I see it? 
how did you not see it? It was right there. Would be a far more reasonable, normal response. If you want plot holes, I've got plot holes for you. Marine actually stands here and she goes, look, we're all going to wait here because L'Oreal has to kind of work out what's going on here. It will take us at least a day's journey to get to the gates that we need to go to. At least a day. And this isn't a plot hole right now. It is a plot hole soon, so uh, just remember that. But they settle down for the night because, let's face it, an OG reading could take days. And I still don't get these two. Egwene dumped him in the very first episode. That completely destroyed any chance at a relationship. Uh, the moment she got offered an apprenticeship to be a wisdom, she just ditched him like she never cared about him at all. Now, the moment they meet up, they're just back like nothing's ever happened. I admit, Rans must have really low self-esteem or something. I don't know whether he's desperate. It's very weird at this point. But not as weird as the looks that Perrin's given her. Um, back in, I think it was episode three or four, uh, there was a lot of comments online about how Perrin was acting really weird about Egwene and they were trying to ship them together. And I just thought that was the usual people doing the usual things that they do. And really it was like, okay, maybe it was written into the script a bit to try to get the shippers over, but they were never going to make anything of it. Uh, this was a guy who was married. Oh, how wrong I was. Because uh, you don't explain this look. Yeah, you don't You don't see them together and then start doing this. And I'm like, what? What are you doing? But Nineveh doesn't miss it. Oh, no, she sees everything. And if anyone thought that my comments about episode 6 just being raff fan fiction from Tumblr, well, you've seen nothing yet. Everyone's asleep. They've got all the torches up and Lan's on watch doing what he should do, being the character that Lan should be. So at least he's getting a good go with this script and he's not actually acting like a completely different person like he did in the previous two episodes. And although he's acting like Lan, he's uh, still not a good warder because there's actually someone behind them whistles. Uh, yeah, just full on whistles and Egwene wakes up for it. Nobody else. Lan doesn't hear it. Lan doesn't notice it. You know, the, the guy with basically superhuman everything due to the bond. He doesn't hear the whistle, but it's literally loud enough to wake up an unconscious Egwin because she's just amazing at everything. At this point, there's a second whistle. She heard that one as well. Lan, Lan still hasn't heard anything. No, the only person who has actually heard anything at this point is the unconscious sleeping Egwin. And she's looking around, and I can only assume she's looking around like, surely Lan heard that, right? Lan must have heard that. If I heard it, Lan must have heard it. Where is he? And Egwene's hearing whistling, and rather than shouting the warder, who is literally that far away from her, you know, the guy who's awake, on guard, on duty, who you'd think would be the one like, hey, mate, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Because uh, I, I think there's someone behind us. There's someone behind us trying to get us her attention, dude. Why haven't you heard it? Hey, 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 mate, hey, mate. No, instead, I'm going to wake up the guy next to me who's unconscious and clearly didn't hear a thing because he's unconscious. Look, it doesn't matter if we have to write a script that doesn't make any sense. As long as we can make Lan look like a moron and Egwene look like a superhuman child, it's good enough for us. So Rand wakes up and says the obvious, what, it, what is it? And she doesn't answer him. She just starts getting up. I don't know why. I mean, she didn't go, well, I woke up to someone whistling at us and then he whistled at us again. Because if she said that to Rand, the obvious thing for Rand to do would be go, Hey, Lan, hey, Lan, uh, someone's whistling at us. I don't know if you've heard that. I don't know why you... Hey, 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 hey Lan, are you deaf? I mean, all of this would make more sense than what's going on on the screen. So she stands up, peering into the darkness, and starts walking towards the wall from the direction that she's heard the whistling. Hasn't told anybody about the whistling at this point in time. Joke's on you. It was a trolloc. I mean, yes. Uh, the whistling is explained. It's not in this part. It's not a Trolloc whistling. The first time I watched this, I did think it was genuinely a Trolloc whistling, and uh, that seemed really stupid, but that's not what happened, so that's okay. There is a bigger issue, though, of where on earth did the Trolloc come from. It's literally a bottomless pit beneath them and an infinite wall, so... What was the Trolloc doing? Had he fallen off the side and was just climbing around for the rest of eternity until he eventually climbed up there? But at least I can say it wasn't actually a Trolloc whistling. And let's face it, at this show, I I'll take it. I'm going to take the positives where I can get them. So Eg Egwene's petrified. She throws her arms up and starts to channel. Even though in this place, channeling really, really bad. 
and in a blast of air, the trollop goes flying back over where it came from into the darkness. I mean, hey, give it off an hour, maybe it'll climb up to the top again like it did the first time. I don't know, but apparently we don't have to worry about it anymore. No, we, we really have bigger issues. And if you were expecting Lan to spring into action during any of that, uh, no, no, he didn't. No, he was still sitting there, completely bewildered, not knowing what was going on in silence, even though whistling had literally been happening behind them, and a scream, it took all of that time and for the Trollic to be blasted over, Egwene saving herself, because she's amazing, um, and yes, I know, uh, because she's amazing, and now Lan sprints into action. Uh, now's probably a good time to point out that warders can literally sense Trollocs. Uh, yeah, that's part of the bond. Uh, part of the bond gives the warders actually the ability to sense Trollocs nearby. Not only should Lan have heard with his superhuman senses that there was whistling happening in the ways, you know, whistling that was loud enough to wake unconscious people, but also he should have naturally just instinctually have felt a Trolloc nearby and been ready to protect them. And Lan runs over shouting, get back, and then looks over at the bottomless void. Yeah, this is Lan, the greatest warder of all time, protecting people from literally nothing because they've already saved themselves or something. And Loyal's like, a Trolloc in the ways? That should be impossible. And this is where they realize that that is how the Trollocs got to the two rivers. That's how they got from the Blight all the way down without being detected. It didn't really make sense that you could have armies that big and that move that fast all the way down there without being detected. But if they just use the ways, well, now they come from Mana Thurin, which had a way gate. Mana Thurin or Shadar Logoth. I'm not really sure which one it came from, but either way, it's not that relevant. It's not like it happened in this. And Moraine's like, and what happened to the guiding? Yes, something in front of you. I know it might blow your tiny little mind that when you find on a straight path something in front of you and it's destroyed, it means that it was destroyed by someone in front of you and you probably shouldn't assume that it's from someone behind you. So Perrin says, did it just get a lot colder in here? And Egwene's freaking out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to channel because you do not channel in the ways that makes Majin Chin come after you. And, um... They're all kind of worried, but not that worried. And what they have done to Majin Shin in this is uh, an abomination, to be sure. Yes, Moraine actually goes, look, when it comes to you, it will speak to you. And you need to ignore what it said. And this is very different than what it was in the books. In the books, it literally would tear you apart. And although it did speak to them, it was always on the edge of their understanding. Now, I can... I can fully understand you changing that to it just being understandable because it's a TV show. And so it makes sense. You can't really see inside their head to see them understanding more sort of visceral base messages. Fine. I get all that. But we should still have the tearing them apart bits. That's important. That's the dangerous bits. And she's just like, it will speak to you and you shouldn't listen to it. As if that's okay. Yeah, just don't listen to it. It'll be fine. This has to be the least scary, efficient villain of a piece that I've seen. And uh, it goes downhill from here. Remember the plot holes because we're doubling down. Lan says we'll never make it to our way gate. Remember that way gate that was over a day's journey away. They're not going to make to it. No, instead, they're going to go to Faldaro. Why? Because Loyal says it's closer. They think they can make that. They're right. There's no way when you're being chased by this, what is meant to be deadly, but doesn't seem to be in this enemy, you're not going to be able to run for a day away from it. You've got to go to something far closer. Faldara. And on this screen, you're supposed to see a flash of pain and fain, except I can't pause it on that because it happens so fast and Amazon's uh, pausing isn't great. So uh, he was the guy that whistled. Now, as I've said, I was a, I'm was a fan of how the magic looks in this, and I know other people aren't, but it works for me. But I, I'm not sure what this is meant to be. You know what this reminds me of? In the Matrix, uh, where they're actually in the real world, and you've got all of those drones spinning around each other and sort of forming one cohesive wave, but they're all individual units. That's what this looks like. Moving, that's what this looks like. Except it's supposed to be wind. It's meant to be wind, but it looks like individual bits of drones. So there's running, there's lots of tension, and at least the sound effect guys are going at it because, you know, someone had to make up for the plot. And like the way gate is up ahead and they all look as if they're like really scared. Um, but the issue that they've got with how they've designed the ways is that that path doesn't look dangerous at all. 
because the blocks that they're all standing on are really quite thick and you could easily just run over that with no trouble whatsoever. So they go over, they reach the way gate and this swarm of locusts that's supposed to be wind appears. I remember in the books, the moment that touched you, that was it. You were a goner. You were literally torn inside out. That's what it enjoyed. It even told them that's what it was going to do to them. That's what it liked. Not in this, though. No, in this, it can literally surround you, touch you, reach you, cover you, and you, nothing happens to you. Like, of all the terrible, terrible villains you could have made, of all the terrible creatures you could have made, one that literally swarms around you and does nothing to you is probably the worst one I could have come up with. There was a perfectly good one in the books, and I don't know why you've changed it. Even with everything else, even with all of the changes, even with any kind of rationalization that they've got for that, this one doesn't make sense because it doesn't fit into any of their reasons for changing stuff. But they changed it anyway, and it's just objectively worse. And so the only reason I can think they changed it is because it's used in the reveal at the end, but it takes up literally like one second. So did they ruin one of the main monsters of the entire first book just for a one second reveal at the end? That didn't even add anything to it, let's be honest. I think yes. So yes, at this point, the swarm of locusts has literally surrounded them, covered them, and it's doing nothing to them. They are completely and utterly unhurt and undamaged in every single possible way at this point. But we find out what Majin Shin actually does to them. Does it tear them apart? Does it rip out their bones? Does it turn them inside out? No. No, it doesn't do any of that. What it does is it, it talks to them. Yes. Scary, isn't it? It talks to them. And what does it do? What does it tell them? Uh, well, it, it tells them things which is basically on par with very poorly created antagonistic YouTube comments. Uh, I get them all the time. If this is what this is, then uh, my YouTube comment section is basically Majin Shin, uh, because I literally get these same comments. Like, Moraine just gets told that she's wrong about everything. Yeah, like literally, the grand total of this deadly enemy is that Majin Shin will tell you you're insecure. And I've actually had YouTube comments like that. That's right, the worst thing that Raph and the two female writers can think of to happen to you is someone speaking to you and telling you you're actually wrong and insecure. Egwene gets told she's nothing, an imposter, a fraud, and definitely not the bestest woman ever in the world. Ran gets told that Egwene will never love him as much as he loves her, and she left him once and she'll do it again. And it's just true, it's true, look, it's absolutely true. She left you because she didn't get, give a damn about you and you got back with her because you're a moron. Look, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to find this thing scary because all I'm thinking at this very scene is at least somebody's telling him because nobody else is bothering. And are you ready for more character destruction? Because you're getting more character destruction. Perrin gets told that you wanted your wife dead. You wanted her out of the way because you loved another woman more. Are you picking up what they're putting down now? Why Perrin was doing those glances when Egwene was with Rand, and why in episode 3 everyone else was going, oh look, they were cuddling up, wasn't it nice? Yes, you're right. This, this tumble of fan fiction was made for the shippers on Twitter. That's the only reason any of this is there, and they've destroyed his character to make it happen. This is a wife that never existed. For who was killed, not just to make him look bad, when he was meant to sacrifice himself for Egwene, then they can go, oh, Oh, it was actually for guilt. No, now they've invented another woman so that Perrin can cheat on her with another woman who's actually with somebody else when none of these relationships ever happened. We are literally destroying the characters of men, just showing them as all they just cheat on every single person that they ever meet. We're all doing that. We are destroying the heroes of the story just to show men bad by inventing things that never happened. Welcome to the Tumblr fan fiction, everybody. Welcome. It's hell. And I'm here. And now, so are you. I hope you enjoy your stay, because I'm not. And Lan gets told that you'll never protect her, you'll watch her die. Yes, Majin Shin has literally just told all of these people some vague kind of... vaguely kind of a bit nasty comments. <sighs> And they're all like, oh no, I can't handle it. Ah, ah, it's all hell. I'm like, what is this?
Like, seriously, do you have skin this thin? I mean, I could put up with this 24 hours a day and it wouldn't even bother me in the slightest. This is really, really just showing how weak the people are that write this show are. If they think that this is really a dangerous and scary enemy, something that's really bad to have happen to you, then I can understand why people need safe spaces. Because if this is something dark and dangerous enough to make you actually completely fall down and crumble, then it's no wonder you struggle through the rest of your life. But you want to know my favorite moment? Because we're about to see my favorite moment. Nineveh, actually, literally, the only thing she gets told is you're not the bestest ever. She gets told, you're going to hear their screams and watch them die, and you won't be able to do anything about it. Like, literally, you are not the bestest person ever, and you can't save them. And do you know what their response is? Do you know what Nineveh's response is to being told that she's not the bestest ever? She becomes the bestest ever! Yes, no one puts Nineveh down. Oh, you think I'm not literally the strongest person alive? You think there's something I can't do? There's nothing I can't do and I'll prove it to you and I will just be able to break every single law of magic in the world. It doesn't matter, I can't be stopped. You tell me I'm not the bestest ever, I'll just show you I am. And Egwene's like, how? We can barely channel. And I want you to remember that the two of them can barely channel. Do you want to know how ridiculous this is? Because I'm going to explain how ridiculous this really is. I was actually willing to accept this in episode four, and I know a lot of people weren't, but I was like, eh, okay. I know it completely broke the magic rules because it's literally about weaves, which means you have to actually form them into something. And while there is an in-law explanation why one character can do this, uh, not for Nineveh. Nineveh can actually, she can learn weaves if she sees them once, uh, but she's never seen anything like this. And I actually let it go because it was meant to be like her having a surge of power. So it was breaking through all the blocks she'd put in place for years. So it was like, okay, if she hasn't really channeled before, you could argue that maybe there's some kind of build up of power in this kind of telling. And so on the first time you break through on everything, it's like an explosion of power. And that's what did it. Okay, I was willing to let it go once. But we're past that now. There's no excuse for that now. And she's just doing it all over again. This isn't a weave. She's never seen this done before. This is literally supposed to be, oh my God, I'm just so powerful. I can do anything. And there's no rules of this magic system anymore because she's broken all of them. Gone are the days where we actually had a magic system which had some kind of flaws or downsides. And, you know, when you use up a lot of power, then you're going to be tired afterwards. There's meant to be downsides to balance it out, but not in this. None of it makes sense. This is literally just one of the magic systems where uh, magic can do whatever we want it to, because uh, we said it can. Yay. And if you want to know my reaction to that scene, I think Moraine's doing a pretty good image of it right there. And also in episode four, it was supposed to be an uncontrolled burst of magic, but this isn't. This is very controlled. Now it's not a weave. She's literally just like sending out power from her. So again, they'd probably try and argue that again, this is just an uncontrolled burst of magic, which happened to do something. Cause she's like, oh my God, do what I'm doing. You know, it's like she's do dodging in the matrix bullet time or something. I don't know what it's meant to be, but you can actually see, hopefully this shows up on the screen. Yeah, there we go. Uh, she's actually over here, but the center of the circle is over here. Like this is the this is the entire orb. So the center is here. It's off center to her. So if this was just an explosion of raw power, it would be in a circle around her in a kind of an explosion. But it isn't. The fact that it's off center means she has moved this deliberately to be in a different area with a different center of focus. So she's controlled this with no training doesn't know what she's doing, didn't know what this thing was, didn't know what would repulse it, has no idea what magic it would require, but magically knows all of it and is in complete and utter control. The response to being told you're not the bestest ever is literally, literally, to become the bestest ever and do things no one has ever been able to do before. Nineveh gets told she's not the bestest ever, then literally just becomes the bestest ever. 10 out of 10, great writing, big girl power. And do you want to know the worst bit? I'm not even done with this scene yet. You see, while Nineveh is actually in bullet time, dodging all the invisible bullets from the ancients that don't exist, 
She's not the only one. Egwene and Perrin see her and they're like, oh my god, she's breaking literally every rule of magic in the entire universe. And then they turn to Moraine and go, you better be quick, because we're not sure how much this plot armor will survive. It could break at any moment. So she just scream at Moraine, do something. And Moraine's like, oh my god, I can't. I'm in bullet time, my own. And look, none of this makes any sense, because we've already established that first, you actually don't need your hands to weave. So it's a crutch and Rain doesn't need it, although she does use it to make it just easier for herself. Fair enough. But we also saw in the first episode, she's there lobbing fireballs and everything and she's moving around at normal human speed because weaving doesn't actually slow you down. I don't know what this is meant to be and why we're going off balance and oh my God, what's we doing? It doesn't make any sense. Now there are times in the books where it literally says that uh, two people are locked in a battle of power and they just stand still just staring at each other and no one else can see the weave so it looks like they're not doing anything but because they're in a sort of battle of wills they're slashing each other's weaves they're throwing up defensive spells and sending out aggressive ones at the same time it's just because they're so concentrating on what they're doing they don't move there's nothing in the power which is stopping them. They're literally just so concentrated and there's no need for them to because it's not like they can dodge the power uh, that they don't bother moving. They're, that would take up thought that they simply don't have. But in this, it's like, oh my God, I'm trapped in all of this power and I don't know what I'm doing. Although her reaction of what the f*** is going on is still pure gold. Anyway, through the power of the bestest person in the world, Moraine actually can just open the gate perfectly fine and it's all fine and Lan has soy face. So they're all running through and Egwene's like, Nanny, what are you doing? And Lan actually comes up to save her because she's actually sit warding off this entire thing. She doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't know what the power is. She's never done this before. No one's ever seen anything like this before because it's literally impossible under any rules of any part of this universe. But she's doing it anyway through the power of fallopian tubes. But at least you think, at least Lan can actually save her in this. This is the person she's supposed to supposed to love. Surely he can save her in this, right? Like she's got to channel to make sure everyone gets out alive. He can at least carry her out. At least he can do that much for her. Because if you thought that, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Instead, he does this. That's right. He runs up to her, gently touches her hips and gives her the slightest tug as if he's scared to touch her in case she files some kind of uh, allegation against him or something. And away we go. That's it. It's like, you know what I would have done if I was Lan and someone was literally channeling to save my life with the, like, the most power anyone's ever seen in the world. I run up to them, grab them, shove them over my shoulder and firemen's lift them out of there because Lan could easily do that and that way she could channel and you could all escape. She'd probably be grateful that she got carried out of there. But you can't have a man save a woman. That's the foundational principle of this entire thing. So instead, he just runs up to her, gives her a slight nudge and then, of course, she can just leave on her own under her own steam. You see how ridiculous it is when you come up with an arbitrary measurement like a man can't save a woman and the things you have to do and the situations you put them in and then the answers you have to come up with about how they escape just make literally no sense. This is why sometimes I do wonder because before and probably in the future, I just say like the, the writers are stupid, the writers are thick, but when you actually subscribe to this whole ideology, you actually put yourself under certain rules. Rules like men can't save women. And so I do wonder if they're actually just awful and stupid and thick, or whether they're limited by all of these stupid rules that make literally no sense, which force them to write situations that also don't make sense. I don't know whether they're thick or just hamstrung by their own belief system. Probably both, let's be honest. So yes, that is Lan and Nineveh just running out completely on her own steam. I mean, she's only channeled more powerful than anyone else alive. Uh, it's the biggest feat of magic that anyone's ever seen. And um, she's not tired. No, she's literally running out there on her own. She's not even tired, not even a bit stressed. Doesn't need Lan. No, Lan just touched her hips and that was enough for her. She let the entire orb down and they just ran out without even a second thought. I mean, you could have had a scene where she ran out being carried and actually maintained the orb, and that would have made sense because now they're safe to the exit, but no, uh, can't have that. She's got to run out on her own steam. And here we are at Faldara. Yeah, it's just out in the open again. It's not hidden. There's no trees around it. It's, there's no grave. I, uh, 
I don't know. I hope you weren't expecting more. I hope you weren't expecting anything to look like what it's supposed to look like, because uh, we're definitely not going to get that here. All of them are a bit tired. They're all, like, heavy breathing because, they, you know, they've run five meters to the exit. Um, Nini's fine. She's, she, Nini's fine. Rain's like, well done, all of you. And really, everyone just means Nineveh because she literally saved them by being the bestest ever. Not a single person questions how she did it or knew how to do it or where she picked it up or how had that power. Nothing. In, no, instead, we skip to Loyal saying the fortress city of Faldara. Um, that's his last line. And then Moraine goes, the eye of the world is a day's walk past Faldara Keep. Now, do you remember that plot Ola said earlier that they also doubled down on? Yes, they're at the Ogier Stone and Lan actually said, our way gate that we want to get to in the ways is over a day's journey away. Over a day's journey. And Loyal actually said before that one step in the ways is equivalent to like a hundred miles in real life. But of course they didn't run there when the Black Wind came after them. They went to Faldora, which was basically right next to them. So they were going to walk through the ways, one of the most dangerous places you can go on the face of the earth, uh, and spend over a day's journey in there. When actually they could have gone to Faldara, which was right next to them, and still only walked a day. Now, yes, this way does mean going through the Blight, uh, but that's not a big deal. Uh, if anything, the Blight is still safer than the Ways, because the Ways had the Black Wind. At least, it should be. But we've just seen what the Black Wind is in this. All it does is talk to you and tell you YouTube comments. So I'm really not sure if they actually did the wrong thing at all, because if I had to choose between going through the Blight or someone going, oh, you're never going to succeed. Oh, are you really insecure? Then uh, I would definitely choose that one because that is no problem whatsoever. Water off a duck's back, mate. I could spend forever in there and it wouldn't bother me. So actually, I probably would have gone through the ways of longer distance too. But if you actually want a plot to make sense, maybe don't say that the ways and the real life journey are exactly the same distance of being a day's journey away. Especially when the ways are literally meant to be the method of fast travel. And yet they take the same time to travel, you morons! And if you thought land crying was bad, don't worry, because this is another man who's completely and utterly broke down and can't control himself, and is just crying in front of all the women again. That, I feel, is definitely going to be a trope that we're going to repeatedly see throughout the season. We are going to see men in tears all over the place, because men really need to show their feelings! Don't they? No one else is crying. Everyone else is fine. I mean, Perrin's bothered, but after all, he's just a man. He's going to be bothered by that kind of thing, isn't he? The men are very emotional. Uh, Egwene's fine. Eve's fine. Moraine's fine. And Moraine's just like, whatever you heard in the winds, put it out of your minds and move on. And I'm like, yes, exactly. Enjoy the last sight of Loyal's awful hair because it's literally the last time you'll see him throughout the entire episode. <laughs> He vanishes like magic. I don't know. No one's like, oh my god, have they actually have they got rid of him? Because we haven't seen him in ages. No, there's not even mentioned again. He just vanishes. I thought Matt was the actor they were supposed to be getting rid of. Not Loyal, but here we are. Now, Faldara is obviously meant to hold off the Blight, so it's all supposed to be very functional and easily defensible. So Lan gets met by the soldiers, and they say, welcome home. And he bows, and he accepts it gratefully, which, uh... If you remember a few episodes ago where um, there was a big discussion about how Lan thought the White Tower was home, but apparently no, he's meant to think this is home. He is meant to think this is home. This is far more like his home. The White Tower never was. So it makes sense to me. This is what was supposed to be, but it disagrees with what they said previously. And I don't have a problem with them saying this but they should have a problem with them disagreeing with their own story. So we get this scene of the throne room, and I think it looks cool. As I said, don't know what it's meant to look like, because I kind of just let my own imagination do things, and I don't really expect my imagination to match up with the show. Uh, but I do have one thing. This is meant to be a defensible fortress, and I don't think having a giant circular opening in a wall which has no door is really defensible, because if anything climbs up there, they're just able to pour in, and you don't even have anything to bar especially as this is meant to be the throne room, so we'll have the most important people in it. I, I, it just, just seems like a massive defensive weakness to me. I don't know. It does look cool, though. Welcome to Agelmar, leader of Faldara. And when I call him that, I mean literally his name. That's the, this character's name. It's not Agelmar. Uh, not from the books. This isn't the same character. This isn't the same person. He doesn't act anything remotely like him. Uh, it's 
he just shares a name, that's it. He doesn't behave anything like him, but I can tell you why he behaves this way. It's because he's a man in power. Yes, this is the first male leader that we've actually seen throughout the entire show. Even in the Two Rivers, it was still the women's circle which led it. In fact, they deleted the sort of the town council, the, 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 main, the men's circle from the Two Rivers. There hasn't been a single man leading anything until this point, until this guy. And he's there to send a message. If you thought they were going to be reasonable at all, no. You see, any man in power, any man in power is obviously going to be evil. He's obviously going to be a tyrant. He's obviously going to be completely and utterly nasty, complete fool, and everyone's going to take the mick out of him. And that's exactly what we get here. But this is just one of the rules. Not only can men not save women, but men in power have to be bad and they have to be put down by women and the women just have to be right about everything and teach the bad man in power exactly how he's wrong and then get one over on him. That's the rules. And the issue with having rules like that is it ruins any kind of creative process because you can't be creative because everything's got to be done by rote. And so from what I've just told you, you can now predict this entire scene. And it would be correct in every single way. That's why this is bad. That's why this is boring, because it's predictable. So Egomar talks to Lan, and he's all very kind and cordial and welcoming, and Lan is very respectful back. Meanwhile, Moraine has a face like a slapped ass. Now, Egomar does just go, and you, Moraine, to die, but she's clearly prepared for what's to come, because she knows that actually he's just a man, and we all know how men in power behave. And he asks her, so what do we owe this pleasure? And she starts to answer, but he immediately stops her. No, I know you're going to, I know you're talking. I know you're talking, but I'm just going to man interrupt you. I'm definitely going to man interrupt you because that is what men do. He says, this anxious sister of mine, because all women are just overly emotional, anxious little flowers. That's what all men say. They certainly don't say it in YouTube videos as a joke. No, we all genuinely believe that. That's what everyone thinks, especially men in power. That's how men in power are always treating people. She wrote to the Ace to Die with overblown stories about the Trolloc rays and how in much in danger we are. She's only a woman. She's hysterical. She's hysterical. That's what all men in power think. And while I appreciate your concern, Faldara has and always will be able to protect its own. We don't need your help. We've never needed your help. No, the arrogance of men is that they can always do everything on their own. And this isn't Egelmar. This is nothing like him. There was this meeting, it did happen, but he was actually incredibly respectful to the Aes Sedai, to the point that he didn't just ask Moraine to come to Tarwin's Gap. He begged her. He says, do you know how much even one A.S. die would turn it? He says, we don't have enough men. Well, I don't think we'll survive if we go there. We'll still go there because that is our duty and that is what we will do. We will die defending it. But we'd really appreciate if you came with us because if you came with us, then you'd actually make a massive difference. We know how powerful you are and we respect that power and we would really appreciate your help. And that is the exact polar opposite of what you've got on the screen. Because you've got one author that knows how to actually write people, and then you've got many screenwriters that don't. Or at least they don't care to. Of course, Moraine starts going, no, no, it's fine. No, no one at the White Tower doubts your ability to guard against the Blight. And of course, he cuts her off and manterrupts her again and starts whining on about, oh, we've always done it. We've always protected it. We'll do it in the future. We've killed more Trollocs than, it would than an A.S. die ever could. And it would make an A.S. die blush. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, it's so obvious and blunt and dull and boring writing. And it's all so predictable. Because Moraine, through the power of fallopian tubes, <laughs> has desperately got exactly what she needs. She, she, so she knows how to put a man in her place and she can twist him round her little finger. And even when he's so arrogant, he won't listen to her. Obviously, because she's a woman, she knows the best thing to do and she'll just convince him anyway. It, Lord Aylmar, if you'll let me finish. I have no intention of advising you because a lord can obviously rule as he wants. And the amount of scorn that was put onto the word Lord is, oh, it's astronomical. I've brought a warning, the Dark One's here, and he's using the ways to bring all the armies through, and Eagle's like, oh my God, oh no, not that. I mean, does that remind you of anyone? Does it remind you of Valder? Because Valder was also another man in power. Does it remind you of that? 
the moment he's actually confronted with any danger at all. He just crumbles and suddenly he's in shock and terror and doesn't know what to do. And he's, please, please, just save me. Just somebody save me. So she's like, now I've scared you into submission. Can you just do what I say? Go and send people off to Tarwin's camp to guard that and go and guard the ways. Just do everything I command, please. Because actually, I know better than you. Despite the fact that you've just put me down, I clearly know better than you. And now you know I know better than you because I've scared you witless. Because after all, you're just a man and crumble at the first sign of danger. He's like, oh yes, do what she says. Because after all, I'm just a man and I've already crumbled. And now, despite the fact that I've just literally spent the last 30 seconds seconds completely attacking her now we're just all gonna do what she says because actually she didn't know better than me after all but we could all see that one coming smog smog ha <laughs> put the man in his place like he deserved i put the lord in his place like he deserved and actually i've got to say i would have no problem with this scene firstly if it was somewhere else not with agelmar because agelmar didn't act like this uh so it's not agelmar but i have no problem with this whole thing acting where an asdi actually does manipulate a leader because that's what the asdi did it does fit in the law yes this is literally the trope the man in the room thinks he knows everything, interrupts her, insults her and everything else. Then the woman comes around and goes, actually, no, I know better than you. Then the man realizes that he was wrong all along and now he puts the woman on a pedestal and let just obeys her and everything. It's literally the stereotype. It's literally the story. It's literally their dream. And we've got it all written down here. But now he's like a different person and he starts to respect her after all. Oh, we've got a long history with Aes Sedai. Now I just really respect all of you and want as many of you as possible. We can all defend Tarwin Scap now. I mean, I didn't want to five seconds ago, but now I've changed my mind for absolutely no reason. And now it's like I've got split personalities or something because he's not even acting like the same person. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Smog. Payden Fane arrives at Faldara out of the Waygate. Don't know how he got out of the Waygate. Uh, he couldn't channel to get in and he couldn't channel to get out. But he's out, uh, so that matters. And also, he kind of jumps off these stairs with a bit of a hop in his step. He's quite a happy chappy in this. He's great. I mean, he even warned them that a Trolloc was going to attack by whistling at them. So all of this is very, very different. In the books, he was a beggar. He was a scrounger. He... Uh, it was more driven off instinct. It was a desperate need to, to follow them. Whereas in this, he's, he's perfectly fine. You know why? Why this guy can't suddenly turn into a beggar? Where well, you can't have him degenerate into what was like literally supposed to be one of the most pitiful creatures of the books at this point? He had no other choice. He was driven by need, but he couldn't even look after himself. He was just dragged around following the group. And he was in a right state by the time they got there. He made a big deal out of it. Well, not this guy. He's fine. Because there's some people you can't humiliate. It's the rules. It's predictable. They can't be changed. It means you can only tell one story over and over and over again, just with different people. And that's why you have to change all of the characters from the books to these new people. Because this happens when you change who those actors are. Then you change who the actors are, you've now got all of these baggage because now you can't stereotype people or you can't do this to people or you can't mistreat certain people because that'd be awful. And that's the problem with all changing people because now you add extra baggage in with all your own rules that come with it and that means you change the story, which means you ruin the story because you're too thick because you can't make a good story because you're obeying all the rules. This is where we get introduced to Min, the seer. Yes, in this little conversation, you get told everything about her. Uh, except it's weird. Because Moraine asks to see her, the seer. Uh, <laughs> because Moraine asks to see her, the seer. And uh, the other woman goes, why do you want to see her? And Moraine just goes, why not? Okay, I mean, that's talented script writing. Uh, yes, the issue that you've got here is that in the very last episode, Moraine says she doesn't believe in foretellings or seers or anything like that. Uh, prophecy, that all means nothing now. That's just nonsense. She dedicated her life to 20 years for it, but she's not like she believes it's true. Except now she wants to meet with a seer because she wants to see the future because she believes it's true. <laughs> the worst response to this is that in response to her going, eh, why not? She goes, yeah, that's my that's my uh, whole attitude as well. What, your whole attitude is why not? There are more complex philosophies that you could have picked, but okay. But she's like, Agelmar begs to differ, and Moraine's like, of course he does. Why would you ask her a question when you already know yourself? Yes, because we're still taking digs at the man. The arrogance of men. And as if to show their intelligence, she asks Moraine, so, uh, why were you at the ways? Because we never heard you were coming. And Moraine just, it's not its not like she gives her some misdirection or an answer or anything. No, she just completely ignores her. 
doesn't answer at all and goes, oh, wow, I know you spent a long time at the tower, so, you know, she was trained there, but you're just too weak to have become an A.S. to die. Now, I appreciate that, actually, we've set up the fact that you have to have a certain power level to become an A.S. to die, and if you don't have that power, they basically kick you out. I like that setup, but this woman is also trained in the White Tower and at no point thinks she didn't answer my question. I could just ask her again because she can't lie. No, uh, she gets completely misdirected by the fact that she just literally changes the subject. Honestly, with script writing this complex, I don't know how any of us keep up. But then Moraine does probably the worst thing that she's done this entire series. And she's like, look, I'm sure I can entrust you, trust your discretion. She's like, oh, what do you need me to do? I need you to send a message to the White Tower. Uh, who would that message be for? Uh, it needs to be to the Reds. I need to, to send them after Matt Cawthon. Yes. Moraine is now going to send the Reg Aja after Matt. She doesn't know if he can channel. She doesn't know if he's the Dragon Reborn. And you know what the Reds do if he can channel? You have to remember, in the last episode, Moraine threatened Leandrin with just telling the Red Aja that she was meeting a man, right? So the fact that she's now sending them after Matt, she knows that they are going to treat Matt very, very badly. And if he can channel, and that means he's the Dragon Reborn, now you're gentling the Dragon Reborn before the last battle and causing the apocalypse. Now, yes, in Moraine's language, she's like, I know he would already go over to the dark and therefore I would basically be taking a pawn of the dark away from him, which is very Moraine. But she also doesn't know that he would. She thinks he would. She thinks he's got darkness in him, but she doesn't know. And she's willing to bet the entire world on it. At first, it's all the wheel wills as the wheel wills, but now, no, it's the wheel wills as Moraine wills. You have to remember that the wheel didn't give Matt a chance. The wheel put him in that situation. The wheel gave him that darkness. And Moraine still isn't willing to trust this or anything. No, now she knows better than the wheel and she's going to cause the apocalypse. All I'm saying is that when the best case scenario is that the Red Ajar will completely and utterly mistreat someone that was in your care and the worst case scenario is that you literally destroy the world then the character writing that you've actually done here and the decision making you've made them choose probably isn't the best i don't really think that moraine actually comes off in any good light of this at all and i don't know what their thinking is behind it and any of the excuses that people had for the last e end of the last episode of, oh well you know we just ended and broke his contract and so we had to write him out of the script none of that stands up here because they didn't have to do any of this and this is really like setting up to completely remove him from the entire series this is like they wrote this and acted this out as if they weren't going to recast him and were just going to delete matt like they were literally going to delete him from the series one of the three main characters of the books I actually cannot think of any other reason why you would have put this scene in or made Moraine make those choices. Of course, now we know that they recast him and everything else, but at this point, I am not. don't think they were sure about that. <laughs> and even in this conversation, she still actually keeps insulting Matt. She's like, there's a man I need you to find. Well, he's a boy, really. It's like, <laughs> you're even insulting his masculinity in this. It's, it's pretty awesome, I have to admit. Then th that's the whole thing. Uh, that would have made sense with the original ages, the ages that they should have cast people at when they were still essentially moving from boyhood to adulthood and they were still very naive. But in this, you've aged them up so far. No, they're men. They're men. Unless you want to do this whole, well, no, a man isn't just an age of being a, boy, a male. Uh, you have to actually do something to be a man. In which case, okay. So what do you have to do to be a woman then? That's an interesting philosophical question, isn't it? But first, Egwene's like to rand. Oh, don't worry about the wind. It, none of it was true. None of it was true. I mean, I don't know what was said. I have literally no idea what was said to you, but definitely none of it was true. And I'm like, I, it was though, wasn't it? it? It was. And then Perrin sees Payden Fane walk past. I mean, normally these kind of scenes are done very quietly in the background. Oh, it's just a quick glimpse. No one's really sure. But in this, he literally just walks straight past them. All of them, grinning like a Cheshire cat, and only Perrin noticed. Uh, none of the others at all, I, and I don't even know what the point of this is. Like, literally, he was meant to be tracking them, but now he's, like, taunting them? It's very strange. 
But Perrin's like, I could swear I saw Payton Fane. I mean, he's literally looking at the back of his head there. And then he was just like, nah, I'm sure it wasn't. Why would he be a peddler? He died. I'm like, how would you even know if he died, Nineveh? It's like, literally, you got dragged off and almost died yourself. But like, now you've come in and you suddenly know how, e how many bodies there were or anything. I mean, he's literally like, I could have swore I saw him. And all he has to do is point at the back of his head. Or, I don't know, walk after him, check anything. No? Again, I know Perrin's meant to be slow of deciding, but he's not meant to be thick. Perrin's like, bell time. Seems like a different life, doesn't it? I'm like, yes, mate. Six hours of this show seems like an eternity to me. So Moraine enters the bar, and there's all these hushed whispers and quick talking about, oh, there's an ASD. There's an ASD has entered the room. I'm like, and the books, that would have made sense because they would have had ageless faces. But it doesn't really mu make much sense here where they just look like 42 year old women. And we get introduced to Min. And if you can recognize that as Min from a description in the books, then I've got a bridge I can sell you. I don't know whether we're going to get an explanation of what that weird tattoo is, uh, but they've definitely given her a top that's so low it shows it for some reason. Uh, I don't know why. Parents talk about the way of the leaf. Oh, it's amazing. The world would be so much better if we just followed the way of the leaf. I'm like, that's not even what Perrin thought at all. Perrin actually told them to their faces that they were basically idiots. And that if actually, if someone was punching him in the face, he'd very quickly defend himself. He was under no illusions that he would defend himself. He may have been torn between violence and not violence. But when the chips were down and he actually needed to do something to protect someone, he did it. If they're really playing up this whole idea that he's like, oh no, I just want to be a complete pacifist. I, that's not what I thought of Perrin at all. She's talking to Min. She's like, any detail you can provide me will be useful. And Min's like, this is very impressive, which isn't how any of this works. It's literally Min couldn't stop it. She would look at something and she'd essentially be sort of reading your aura. It's, it's nothing to do with the one power. It's just something that she, happened to her. Nobody really knew where it came from or anything. We just knew that the pictures that she saw came true. They were always true. But when there is no on and off switch, I don't see how something could be invasive. It's literally just looking at something and being like, oh no, it's so invasive because I'm looking at you and I'm actually observing the light that bounces off your face. I mean, it's not like anyone's got any choice. And Min's like, do they know what they are? And she's like, no, no one does. The Ace and I have kept that secret and for good reason because if everyone found out who you were, then you would get hounded every Every minute of the day because you can see the future and I'd agree with her if Moraine actually believed in prophecy or foretelling but she spent the last episode telling us that she didn't and she thought it was all nonsense so now I'm not sure why she really cares also this is Raph's face whenever he thinks of the next plot line that destroys the law now in book one of the wheel of time which this series is like very very loosely stayed within as its general plot arc min actually isn't that big of a character she appears once gives out a load of visions and then you don't really see her again so just from that perspective i actually don't mind that they've moved her to a different place everything all the changes about her are obvious but to be honest they've done that with so much stuff if i said it every time it would get very dull and boring so i just let that slide at this point but one thing is, her visions were always very interesting, and there was loads of them, and actually what she said about all of the main characters, they had so many different things that abound them, because it was like all of their main points in the pattern in the future, that it actually set up major plot arcs for books in the future time and time again, and actually once you read them all, you can go back to that very first scene in the very first book, and actually go, oh, that referred to this, and that referred to this, and that referred to this. There was loads of them, and it was great. And in this, there's barely anything. It's like, ooh, Perrin's got yellow eyes. I'm like, oh, congratulations, love. None of us knew that one. You're amazing. And it really doesn't tell you that much. And I can't work out whether they just weren't sure that they weren't actually going to get another series. So they're trying to keep it relatively condensed within one season on its own. Of course, we found out that there's actually two seasons, but they may not at the time. Or whether they just actually don't know what they're going to do in the future. Like, they, they could just look at the books and go, oh, we'll do this, 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 and this, which is what I'd do. But they're not sure if they're going to change all that and rewrite all that. So they have no plan for the future. There is no big roadmap of all the future events. So they can't put them in this. And so if anyone thinks that, well, in the future, maybe they'll be closer to the books, no. Because if they were going to do that, they could put it in here. Because if they were doing the books, they'd know the future. They'd know the roadmap. And they could just put in the major events. They could put in the same events they were already in Min's visions in the first place. But instead, what we get is some cut-down, weak and feeble, just 
lazy premonitions that really just make her seem pathetic as a character. And what comes later on, I don't think helps, but this scene is just... Ugh. So welcome to the grand total of the visions. Perrin has yellow eyes and blood running down his chin. Rand has a baby that looks like a baby. No, that's literally what she says. And the girls have a white flame and a ring of gold. And this is literally the screen that we get when she's saying that. They don't show us this vision because apparently a flame and a ring of gold is just far too complicated and expensive to put on the screen or something. And Moraine's taken aback at that one because she knows what it means. And I think most people can work out what that means. But I'm not going to say it here because, uh, spoilers. But the worst one is this, where she goes, oh, they've got golden fireflies around them and the light is trying to eat up the darkness and the darkness is trying to eat up the light. And all we've got is these little tiny flecks on them and there's no darkness trying to swallow them up at all. They're just kind of winking in and out of existence. There's no shadow. There's no dark. There's no mist. It's not how I imagined it all, but not just that. Half of it doesn't exist. There's no darkness on this picture. There's no shadow on this picture. It's just the bar and some twinkling lights. And I've said that I'm normally a fan of all of the CGI in this. I'm quite lenient on it, but this is easily the worst CGI they've put in. Like, literally, you should have just shown us that woman's nose again. It would have been way better. And then she says the next piece of nonsense, which is literally just like, for what it's worth, they're all clear visions. The clearer the vision, the more important it is to the pattern. And they're not always that clear, and these must be very important to the pattern. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how Min worked. No, what she saw was fact. It was a fixed point in time, and it always happened. If she saw it, it happened. And that is important, because if she sees something bad, it means it's fact. And she goes through her entire life knowing that that bad thing will happen at some point, and she's got to live with that and the weight of that. And that's important to her character, and it's important to anyone that she tells the visions. Whereas, if she just tells you something, and it's bad, but it might not actually happen, then it carries no weight whatsoever. You've completely undermined all of her visions by giving them the possibility that they could be wrong. But then Moraine is like, oh, did you see something for me? And she goes, yes. I saw the Emerlin seat in her full regalia and she's going to be your downfall. And I'm like, yeah, downfall on your knees. Am I right, lads? No, uh, it's just... Hey, you put it in the story, I make it into a joke. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Hey, all I'm saying is if she's literally going to destroy you after everything you've done, uh, maybe you weren't as good in that room as you thought you were, love. Hey, it's no use making that face out of love. It's not going to work on men. Although they've probably rewritten that too, let's be honest. But the thing that makes me laugh the most of that is Perrin. You get to see something that has literally already happened. Rand, you get to see something which is basically just standard for most men. Oh look, it's a man with a baby. <gasps> what a shock. The women, you get to find out about an entire plot arc which is major to their characters. And Moraine, the same. I don't know if we're getting some kind of idea about the level of importance that the writers apply to each of the different characters. But I'm gonna say we are. Also, that is Tarwin's Gap. And look, I maybe I've got this wrong from the books, but I was under the impression that Tarwin's Gap was like a ride away from the castle. It wasn't just outside of a window down the street. They like literally had to it was a decent ride away from the nearest city, as far as I can remember. But here they're just oh no, it's right next door. Of course it is. Yeah, they're just the Trollocs come and then they're instantly just attacking everybody's families. It it seems like an awful idea to do. Like I know, like I know, essentially a castle there would be a greater defensive location, but this was still a city where people lived with their families and children, and uh, Trollocs would have poured through that all the time. So Rand asks Moraine who Min was, and she's like, "Oh, it was a woman that I knew since she was very young." And then Eve's just like, "Stop lying to us!" And Moraine just immediately turns on her. You forget, girl, that I cannot lie. And it's like, yes, it is stupid. You keep using that language, and the books actually got it better to it. Everyone knew that they wormed around the truth. No one really accused them of lying. They asked them to speak plainly. It was far better phrased. But in this, no, you don't want to use language like that because you might confuse your audience. And then she just comes out with it. I'm mean, like, so dissembling who she was in the first place was completely pointless because you were willing to just tell them literally everything immediately afterwards anyway. So why try and step around the truth if you don't mind telling them the truth? So she's like, well, Min can see the future. I was hoping she could tell me who the dragon was because whoever isn't the dragon, if you go to the eye of the world, you're going to die. And she's like, well, I don't want to kill all of you. So I just wanted to find out who it was so I didn't have to take all of you with me and just let everybody else get killed, which admittedly seems like a pretty good plan. 
plan. It's just a shame that by this point, she still hasn't worked out who it is. In fact, do you want to know in relation to the TV series where Moraine actually worked out who the Dragon Reborn was? Uh, episode 2. Right at the start of episode 2 is where she basically knew where the Dragon Reborn was. But let's face it, if she can't work out that the Dragon Reborn needs dangly bits, then she wasn't really in much hope to actually work it out in this turning compared to the other turning, even though this definitely isn't another turning, it's just a badly written fan fiction of the original lore. And she says, if you go to the Eye of the World and you're not the Dragon Reborn, you'll be ground to dust between two forces of nature. Which again is complete fantasy and just something they made up. But I do appreciate the fact that Rand actually has tears in his eyes for the second time in the same episode. But Egwene, oh Egwene, she obviously asked the same question she did at the end of the last episode. Well, who is it? Because at the end of the last episode, she was literally told that the apocalypse will happen and everyone will die and everybody you love will be wiped off the face of the earth with an entire new age built on the ground up bones. And Egwene just said, well, yeah, but if I'm not the Draken Reborn, what happens to me? In an incredibly selfish way. And that's all I think when she says this, that's all I can think of. And it just makes me think that, yes, once again, she's just concerned with number one. So, and then Moraine goes, but she didn't know. So I'm just going to take all of you. And whichever isn't the dragon, you're just going to get wiped out. And Perrin just goes, how can you be sure? Maybe we'll survive. And I'm like, that's your response? That's your response to being told that someone is going to take you to somewhere where three quarters of you will just not come back. It's not, well, maybe we can do something else. How can we escape this? Maybe we can get out of it. We can definitely survive. It's like, no, you don't know me. I mean, I know you've got literally a prophecy of the future, which is definitely certain because it speaks of the pattern. And this has to happen with absolute fact. This is a fixed point in time to use a Doctor Who reference. Oh no, none of that. No, poor old Perrin is so thick he can't even understand how prophecy works. He's not trying to wheedle his way out of it. He's not trying to think of a way around it. He's not looking for a loophole. Perrin, no. Perrin's just like 100% certainty of death. Fixed fate in the future. Yeah, I'm so good. I can get around that. It's like, oh, what? Are, what? And he only gets worse because he moves on to, well, isn't there a fact that Matt's the dragon and we could actually survive? I'm like, no, I don't think you get how this works because she's taking all of you. So whoever isn't the dragon isn't coming back. So if Matt's the dragon, the only difference is it's not going to be three of you that fall over. It's going to be four. You're definitely not going to survive. Oh, maybe we could survive. Oh, Perry. I, I, like, I wasn't that big of a fan of Perrin's arcs in the first book. He was never one of my favorite characters, but they've really done him a disservice in this one. <laughs> and then Moraine goes, it's easy to use doubt as a crutch. I'm like, I... I I'm not even sure that makes sense. And then she goes, but doubt is the first step towards the dark. And I'm like, are you quoting Jedi at him or something? I really sound like something straight out of Obi-Wan's mouth. I don't know what you've been watching, love, but um, it's a bit of a weird line for Wheel of Time, isn't it? I mean, I've always thought that the first step on the path to joining the Dark One is basically being pure evil. It seems to be a key component of basically going over to what is essentially Satan. I don't know, call me crazy, call me crazy. But Moraine goes, I didn't choose this path for myself as much as anyone else did, but I will follow it because I know what is right. And I'm like, well, at least she's got some principles. I mean, at this point, she's literally told you all that the fate of the entire world rests on you and all you're doing is like, yeah, well, what about me? What about me? And I'm like, oh... You're supposed to be heroes. There was a sense of duty. Duty was central to this. And all this just comes down to me, 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 me. And did I say that Nineveh was actually better in this episode? Because I forgot about this bit. Because she said, you've made your choice, Moraine, but uh, we'll make her own. Because powerful as you are, I don't think you can carry the four of us there against our will. And I'm like, who on earth do you think you are? You've not been trained, you've not been taught anything, and you've got a load of blocks that you're supposed to have, of emotional blocks, that stop you from channeling. You are nothing, and even if you get angry enough to actually channel, then still, you can actually be shut down like a newborn babe because you have none of the training and no none of the weaves. And that goes for Egwene about a hundred times more. Between you, there's literally nothing you can do to Moraine. And there's actually scenes in the books which prove this. When Nineveh actually did this kind of thing and thought she was amazing and always got trounced by people that had more knowledge, albeit less power because knowledge, skill, and proficiency make up for power. And she didn't even know how to even stop them doing what they were doing. She didn't even know what they were doing was possible. 
and yet in this she thinks she can defend against it and in this i can kind of understand it and they've given her not one but two super saiyan moments that just come out of nowhere where she breaks literally every law in the universe with absolutely no knowledge no training no skill or anything else so no wonder she thinks she can take on everybody but unless the writers are in there to give you another hack job which doesn't make any sense then you stand literally no chance and moraine can do whatever she wants to you and the only thing you'll be able to do is get down on your knees and beg for mercy so this just becomes another scene where either you trust what the writers have done with literally zero knowledge about anything in the world or you go off what actually the rules of this universe are and in that case what this turns this scene into is basically what we've seen multiple times before from both Nynaeve and Egwene wherein they're in a situation where they are powerless they don't have a choice there's someone with more authority and power and control of the situation and then both of these little girls come out and they start threatening the person in charge when they have no ability to do anything about it and it makes them look stupid because they're not in control here but they think they are and I know what this is meant to do it's, it's meant to to make her look strong like she's got a spine and speaking truth to power but all it makes her look like is a scared childish little girl which is completely unknowing about everything in the world and i know the writers like oh yeah she's amazing she'll be able to stand up to everybody and they have literally no idea about what they're writing about or how it comes across there are ways you can write strong women into the script but this isn't it if you want them to do it, they should probably actually have a strong foundation. If you wanted this to happen, then you probably should have left both of them at the White Tower so they could train and then do it in a future episode. But you didn't, because you just wanted them to be amazing and have everything given to them on a silver platter without trying at all. Uh, but that's not a hero's journey. That's not a game. They don't sacrifice anything for this. They just start amazing and find out how they're even more amazing later on. And it makes them look stupid along the way because they have no reason to actually believe anything about what they're saying. It's just that the writers make everything that they say suddenly magically happen, even though it makes no sense. Now, if I was Moraine, I'd shield them and start spinning them around the room at super speed just to show that actually, no, uh, they're not the ones with any power here. But apparently, no, Moraine's not going to take that track because she's, I don't know, she's probably scared of them, let's be honest. In this script, she's probably just scared of them. So she goes, well, you can make whatever decisions you want, but it doesn't matter because you're not even controlling your own life. The wheel is, and you can't fight the pattern. And while technically true in the universe, I think it's a dangerous trope to keep playing onto because the moment that you start writing into the script that everything is preordained and fate and has to happen uh then you may get audiences that aren't as knowledgeable about the law just going well what's the point of the entire series then if we all literally know that none of these characters and their decisions mean anything then why are we even watching because it's just all preordained. No one has any control. No one makes any decisions. So what's the point? So actually, I would probably lay off that as a trope in the story significantly. But let's contrast the different kind of emotional responses to what's just happened. Nineveh was all strong going, no, you can't stop me. I'm so powerful. You can do anything. And Ran just goes, nothing in here today is optional. We don't have any control here. We better just w w do what she's doing. And it's like, oh, God. So the, the women have a spine they're strong they stand up and the rand ran just collapses at the first sign of trouble and the thing is i know i've just argued against the other point and this would actually be a far more reasonable response but it's just the way it's delivered oh no i can't do anything i'm just completely and you have to look at it from the writer's point of view and what they want to show one's strong one's weak guess who's which <laughs> and then ran's like she can force it if i want to and he was like let her try and we're like oh Every single time you open your mouth, it makes you look more stupid because you have no idea about how insane what you're saying is. Hey, give it a couple of years, give yourself some training, and I'd completely agree with her that Moraine wouldn't stand a chance. But at the moment, unless the writers literally just turn her into the creator himself again, randomly for no reason whatsoever, then, um... No, she's still not going to stand the chance. And then he's like, well, we left the village to protect our loved ones, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to do what she says. And he was like, well, you're trusting this entire prophecy. We only think one of us is the dragon reborn because she told us. And I'm like, yeah, because two of you definitely aren't. It's literally impossible, especially in an Eve. Still literally impossible, even by the prophecy itself. And yet apparently you've never even been told that one.
But because they wanted the mystery to last this long in the TV series, no one has ever really done anything to actually show off that they were the Dragon Reborn. Whereas before, actually, that was shown all the way through, and it was very obvious who it was, because it's actually not central to the plot. It never was. The plot was always about the development of the characters. It was about them training, learning, growing as people. It was about them turning from children into adults. That was the story. And yet in this, all of that was removed. So they had to replace that story, the important key element of the characters and the character development with something else. And it was replaced with just a soulless mystery about, ooh, who's the dragon reborn? I don't know. That's why this entire series has felt so soulless, because they removed the thing that made book one what it was. And one of the reasons that was removed is because they wanted to age up the characters. These people were no longer children. They were full-grown adults. They were no longer experienced with life, because they'd actually had many years to do that and many different life experiences, none of which they had before. And so, would you have to ask himself, why did they do that? And they did that for scenes like we're about to get just now. And that's why I hate this next scene. Not just because I don't care about this next scene, just because I don't want to have to care about this scene, just because I don't want you to even have to talk about this scene and how it destroys all of the, f the characters, but because this scene, this drama, this fan fiction was put in at the cost of what made the books as good as they were. We literally lost the best thing about the series for it to be replaced with the worst thing possible for any hack writer to put in itself. And that is, of course, childish early adult relationship drama. Which is something I despised when I was going through it myself. The last thing I would do is want to see other people go through it. I actually can't imagine anything worse. Maybe pulling teeth, but even then I'd be like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe I do just want to go to the dentist and get that out. But Rand's like, ah, but she can still mislead us. Do you think that she's just learned today that all of us will die there except the Dragon Reborn? And like, to be fair, I only learned about it in the last episode, so I don't know when she learned about it because it just literally came out of nowhere and it was just... But Egwene's like, I'm not going to the Eye of the World because I think she's right. I'm not convinced at all. But if there's a chance, then I think it's worth going. And I'm like, well, at least she's actually got some morals for the first time in the series. But Egwene's like, Nineveh, you're a wisdom. And although you haven't shown any for the entire series, if an Aes Sedai wasn't part of this then you would go and sacrifice yourself without a second thought. It's only your hatred of Aes Sedai keeping you back, even though that's completely unfounded and has never really been explained, and it doesn't actually make sense why you've got any now, because the only reason you hate them is because, apparently, they don't like someone with a peasant accent, even though every single thing that you've seen, including the fact that your Merlin seat is just a peasant fisher girl, actually goes contrary to what we said in that very just cheap one-off line that we put in the first series. And even though we've literally contradicted predicted that at every other turn throughout the entire show apparently you still believe it and it's still central to your character even though nobody can actually explain why if we get past all of that you're still a wisdom and you want to help people and that means you'd go this is really a heavy emotionally loaded scene i can tell you and Rand's like, I've lost too many people already. I can't you lose you as well. At the end of the day, if I had to choose a choice between going up a mountain or the apocalypse, then either way I'm screwed, so I might as well just go up the mountain anyway. It's, it's, it's not a choice. This isn't a choice. It's not even something you should be having a discussion over. This is why in the books there was no discussion about it. Everybody just went because it's literally the apocalypse. It's not like you can just hide somewhere and it'll all go away. And Perrin, never in danger of being the smartest in the room, goes, yeah, but what if we're, what if we're throwing our lives away for nothing? What if we just shouldn't go? And I'm like, it's still the literal apocalypse, dude. That's what you're looking at. You're not going to survive the apocalypse. You may not survive up a mountain. Firstly, I'd take the 25% chance that it's me and go up the mountain compared to literally the apocalypse. It's like these people don't even know what the apocalypse means. Millions of fades will sweep across the earth and wipe literally everything out. And Perry's like, yeah, but why if I just stay up a tree or something? Then what happens next is my most hated scene out of the entire series. Compared to literally anything else, including what they did to Matt's dagger, um, this is my most hated one. 
Why? Um, because this is something that I don't want to have to care about. I normally wouldn't care about. This is all beneath me. I don't want to have to care about the relationship drama of fantastical characters that don't exist. Like, literally, the minimum that I require of someone in order to care about their emotional state is that they actually exist. So normally in shows, I just wash over this kind of stuff because I don't really want to have to care about it. But in this, it's making me care about it, and it's making me talk about it. Because this completely destroys the characters, it changes who they are, and it destroys the bond between them, which means it actually matters for the story. And none of it happened. This wasn't required to happen. This wasn't necessary. All of this is complete fantasy and fiction that was just invented for absolutely no reason. And this is why they aged up the characters. They aged up the characters so they could do this to them and so they could destroy who they were and the relationship between them. And one of the key things of the original books is the bond between all the characters. But that doesn't matter now because it's all been blown apart. Which is rather coincidental, because in this episode, that's also not the only thing that's been blown. So now it- so it starts with Perrin, who's very quickly becoming stiff competition for Egwin as my most hated character this episode. And he goes, what if it's none of us who's the Dragon Reborn? What if it's Matt? And Rand actually comes out with an emotional response, which I think literally has summed up so many of my reactions to this entire season. What? I don't think more needs to be said. I think I could probably just replay that clip to most of my reviews in most of the random moments that they just write into this stuff. And Rand just goes, what? Why couldn't it be him? And he gets that as a response. I mean, all I'm saying, mate, is if you've got anything, if there's any warning sign, if there's one single thing that means that you shouldn't date someone and that you should just gut get out of their stat, if you didn't actually listen to the fact that she's actually dumped you before and you didn't take that as a warning that maybe you just shouldn't be together, I would say that that face and that expression right there is why you shouldn't be dating Egwene. If you ever get that look from him and say, oh, come on, you stupid idiot, then maybe, just maybe, they're not for you. And honestly, at the moment, I feel like Rand is just channeling all of my emotions about this entire show right into this very expression. But here we are. And he's like, Yo, you've never thought of much of him, have you? And it's like, no. Oh, and to be fair, should she have done? I mean, really, Matt from the books was a very different character. He was a very likable character. He was many people's favourite character. But in this, he was just... Ah, he came out with some funny jokes. But apart from that, there wasn't really much to him. He was just a generic thief. He was just trash. And so you can't really blame her for not liking him at this point. And I know he's like, oh, well, he's your friend. But all of this reaction over Matt really did... <sighs> It would have made sense in the original law, but in this, I can't blame any of them. And to be honest, that just makes the rest of what he says weirder. Because he starts going on and goes, oh my god, yeah, it's like, yeah, I know he's basically trash, but he's had such a hard life and you can't blame him because he doesn't have much. I'm like, well, he seemed to have plenty. It was just all of other people's, you know? It's like, so what he does have, he gives to his friends. And I'm like, yeah, he's probably nicked off of that from you and just given it back to you. But Egwene's just like, well, he left us, Rand. It's like, you know, you saw his face. He probably just went back for that dagger. And I'm like, oh. Apparently, she doesn't like him because he didn't follow them into the ways which was literally kind of disguised as sort of certain death. I mean, the horses wouldn't have survived in there, so he did have a good reason not to go, but apparently he's going to go back for the dagger, even though he was cleansed of any of it, because apparently in this now he's got a big evil inside him. So she's actually discussing that actually he's evil, and Rand's saying, yeah, well, he might be evil, but the reason he's evil is because he had a tough life as a childhood and uh, didn't have much. What are we even discussing here? I mean, I don't actually know the conversation that we're really having in front of us, and it really just seems set up to cause friction between them so that someone else can step into the middle of it and ruin everything. But then she bursts into almost tears and goes, he left us, and I'm like, yeah, and I still don't know why you care about that. Like, I'm not sure why you think that's a big deal. Why is it bothering you so much? I mean, so far, the only problem to him not coming that could possibly affect you is he might be the Dragon Reborn. Is, is that what you actually think? Because you've just had a big discussion that he isn't the Dragon Reborn. You don't believe he is because you think he's evil. So if he's not the Dragon Reborn to you, then it doesn't really matter if he's there at all because all the thing that would happen to him is he'd go there and die with the rest of you because he wasn't the Dragon Reborn anyway. So we've literally had a discussion where Egwene thinks that he isn't the Dragon Reborn, but... The only reason she would be mad is if he was the Dragon Reborn, because that would mean that the rest of them were going to get killed for no reason. So she simultaneously 
thinks that he isn't the Dragon Reborn, but is mad because they he left them because he might be the Dragon Reborn. It, it's such a struggle trying to work out what on earth these characters actually want other people to do, unless she just wants him to tag along. I don't know, because apparently she's not that close to him. Ran says that she doesn't even bet she doesn't even really know him. So if she doesn't know him, she doesn't care about him, and she thinks he's evil, I'm not sure why she's concerned whether he comes along with them or not. But at least Rand has the best response. <laughs> he just goes, you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? And Egwene's like, what does, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> the only, if anyone ever says that to you, the only response they deserve is, you know. <laughs> of course they know. That's why you said it, because they know. <laughs> but then at least Rand goes, uh, you're the only person that's ever really left. And we get this beautiful look of, oh, I can't believe you just said that to me. When it's absolutely true. So, uh... I don't know really what you expected. But don't worry, because the thickest person in the room has something to say about that. Perrin's like, don't speak to her like that. And the only response at this point that that man deserves is just to be told to get back in his box. But apparently, no, we can't have that. We can't shut down a situation like that. So now we're about to enter hell. Because that prompts Nynaeve to shout, stop it. Perrin starts squaring up for a fight immediately. And suddenly, we've got the big odd man. Oh, you are, oh, you are an apology. And I'm like, you have to remember, literally about five minutes ago, he was in the bar going, oh, if everyone was innocent and we all just didn't do any violence to each other, the world would be a better place. And now, at the mention of somebody else who has completely unrelated to him, remember, Matt's more of a friend to Perrin than Egwene is. That's just a fact. And it doesn't matter what the writers change, it's still a fact. I don't know what this is meant to be, especially when compared to his Tinker speech. Is this how we're gonna get it? Is this supposed to be Perrin's war between all oh, the animalistic nature and all oh, with per peace loving side? Are we literally gonna throw all of the lore from the books and how it was all developed over there? And now we're just gonna get it because they're fighting over Egwene. It's like, really? Is that the base as we can get? Is that just. Oh, that's about as complicated a story as you think your readers can handle, is it? This is supposed to be Game of Thrones. What I'm going to get, instead of anything kind of complicated that kind of respects the intelligence of the audience, is just a run-of-the-mill, basic, blunt, friendship, love triangle. I've only really just realized in this scene that Perrin is actually taller than Rand. And uh, that's not who it's meant to be at all. But Perrin's like, you are an apology. And Rand's like, for what? The truth? And he's right. It is the truth. But then he's like, stop it, both of you. I'm fed up with you two arguing over like she's something she you can win. I'm like, well, firstly, I mean, she probably is. Let's be honest. That's how the story's going to go. But then she's like, oh, no, I've said it. I can't believe I've said it. I mean, literally everybody else in the entire room knew except Rand. But now I may have actually told my friend something that he actually deserved to know all along. And apparently I'm bad about that. And I feel really bad that I've done that. I feel really bad about telling the guy that he's actually been cheated on all of this time. And this is where the rest of the story really begins to fall apart at this point. Because Egwene just looks at her as if, oh my god, I can't believe you've just said that. What have you done? As if she's guilty. And if somebody feels guilty, it's because they are guilty, right? That's how it works. And she doesn't say the obvious, as if, what on earth are you talking about? There's nothing between me and Perrin. That would be the default response if nothing had actually happened between you and Perrin. So the fact that she just looks at her in guilt and surprise, as if, oh my god, I can't believe you told Ran that, is means that what she said is true. And we need to remember that because the story doesn't. And Perrin knows it's true, and Perrin isn't denying it either. Whereas the first response to this would be complete and utter confusion if none of this was true. So everyone looks guilty and says, Rand's like, and Rand's like, oh, it was in front of me the whole time. The day you proposed to Layla was the day I got together with Egwene. So we all know exactly what's gone on. Everybody knows, but apparently no one's supposed to know. And apparently in the future, it's about to not happen. So we should all remember this scene because no one's denied it. Everybody's guilty. It's definitely true, but it's definitely not true in the future if you just give it five minutes. And Perrin at this point is literally moving in so close to Rand. I did wonder if it was just going to kiss him as well at this point, but apparently he's meant to be really threatening um that's not what you do to somebody if you're trying to be threatening to him mate but here we are so he goes the only woman i've ever loved is my wife literally untrue actually untrue we know that's untrue because of everything that's just happened in front of us so i don't know what this statement is even meant to mean it's meant to be threatening i think but it's also not a threat and it's also not true and he knows it's not true and everyone in the room knows it's not true so none of this makes any sense whatsoever at the point but apparently we're just all supposed to swallow this as if it's just a stunning amount of right 
writing. And let's face it, we should probably just give it an award or something because I have to say, this is the most stunning and brave piece of acting, writing, and complete talent I've ever seen in my life. And I wouldn't care about this. I genuinely wouldn't care about this. I wouldn't even show anyone this scene. But... This has literally destroyed the entire relationships of any of these characters because Perrin has been cheating with Egwin, although apparently we're all going to deny that later on. And that means that Rand has now fallen out with Perrin and Nynaeve's guilty because of everything else and all of them should fall out after this and it completely changes the bond of all of them, which is meant to be friends, but apparently no one can be friends nowadays. No, everyone's got to be having it off with everyone else or secretly in love with everyone else because that's the kind of writing that we've just got to degenerate into because we can't come up with good stories or plot points Points. we don't have story arcs anymore all that had to be cut all of the good bits had to be cut because we didn't have any time because we had to fit in this of a load of things that don't make any sense of a load of people loving people and apparently cheating on people who are also not going to cheat on people and they're not they're going to say they love them and think they love them and everyone's going to th say they love them but then they're also then in the very next breath going to deny loving them in the first place so we have to simultaneously hold in our heads that Perrin loved Egwene doesn't love Egwene only loved his wife even though his wife actually fell away from him so in the first episode when she was actually like oh I don't really like you it's not like she found out that he was cheating on Egwin no you're not supposed to think that anymore but you're simultaneously supposed to think that that's the reason why she did that that's supposed to explain all of her actions when also you've got him going no actually none of that happened and Egwin saying it later on as well and Rand even agreeing with it even though all people at this point know that Perrin cheated on all of them and Egwin knows it and Eve knows it and everyone knows it except Rand who knows it now but not going to know it in the future and everyone's supposed to give up So rather than having a cohort of a main cast where everyone's just friends together and they're all great and we can actually just worry about the plot. And instead of that, we've got Perrin moving so close to Rand because he thinks it's threatening, but really it just looks like he's moving in for the kiss on that as well. He's not going to forgive you, Perrin, even if you do that. It's not going to win him over. I don't care how good you think your beard is. I mean, seriously, if this scene isn't done for shippers, I don't know what is. Because men, when they're about to have a fight, they don't do this. Do you want, do you want me to know? Do you want to know how I know that Raph has never been in a fight? How the two female writers have never been in a fight? This. <laughs> this isn't how men behave in a fight. Rand is literally looking at Perrin's lips and swallowing. It's for shippers. This entire clip is for shippers. It is. It just is. So Rand backs up walks out and Egwene just lets him go and literally no one has denied anything that's been said. But also at the same time, even though what's been said is that Perrin and Egwene cheated on each other and cheated on Rand and have always loved each other, we're also supposed to think that nothing went on and it's all Rand's fault. I challenge anyone to watch this scene and think Rand's the one in the wrong. Anyone. Anyone on earth. <laughs> and then he was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And like, what you didn't mean to tell the truth let the cat out of the bag i don't really know what you didn't mean to do because i don't think the Eve was even in the wrong this is one of the reasons why i liked her because she finally told rand something that he deserved to know he had a right to know and she told him I'm like, good, good. And the only thing that Nynaeve has ever regretted in her entire life during this season is something that was actually a morally positive thing to do. And it's one of the few things that's actually reduced her to almost tears. The fact that she did a good thing. She also tugs on her braid, something that I keep seeing comments on that she never tugs on her braid. And it's like, no, she does. It's just she doesn't do it when she's angry anymore. She does it when she has to think of the bond between all of the women that was set up in the first episode. That's why she hasn't been tugging on her braid. Uh, because everyone that read the books would have associated it with her being angry. And she's not angry in this. Because you can't do that because it would be a stereotype and we need to break stereotypes. She doesn't even have the anger block on her power in this. Because you can't do that in this, because of the stereotype. So they changed the meaning of the bond, which is why she doesn't go around tugging it all the time. Because it's only in like moments of severe pain or emotional distress that she needs to remind herself of that strength is what she does. They changed it into a positive thing rather than a negative thing. Because you can't have Nynaeve with a negative trait. And if that sounds like basic and a terrible reason, yes. But it doesn't matter if it's basic and a terrible reason. That's the truth. And it's because of the rules that you have. And it's why you can't write anything good. Because if you've got all of these rules that you need to obey, then you can't write anything good. Because there's no creativity involved. It's just painting by numbers. Moraine is looking out at Tarwin's Gap from her actual bedroom. And uh, I still don't like this. 
move of Tarwin's Gap. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was sure Tarwin's Gap was a lot further away than literally outside of someone's bedroom. So lands like they'll come, and believe me, they certainly will, because I've seen the rest of the episode. But Moraine's like, what, willingly? And I'm like, okay, at least I like this line, because that means that Moraine knows, even despite Nynaeve's literally idiotic threats, that they don't have a choice. She can make them. She does have the force, and she should do. It doesn't matter what Nynaeve's power level is. They shouldn't write anything at this point where Nynaeve can actually overpower Moraine, because that would be literally just the height of stupidity, but who knows. So... I can at least appreciate that they've done that. And I also like this because I think they're setting up something which uh, isn't a spoiler, but, you know, spoilers for the episode. Uh, but they've already given everybody enough to work out at this point that if everybody that isn't the dragon dies who goes to the eye of the world and Moraine's going, then she's going to face their same fate. And that means that she knows what will happen to Lan because we've seen what happens to Warders if there is to die, dies. So I do at least like this setup. The fact that we know that Moraine cares about Lan and what happens to him. And uh, I don't actually think that in this, it's herself she's feeling sorry for about what's about to happen. So Moraine goes, oh, there must be something out of the Borderlands air. It's making me dwell on the past. And Lan's like, what? It's not like you to dwell on the past. Dude, for the last 20 years, she spent digging through 3,000 year old prophecies. Dwelling on the past is literally all she ever does. What follows is bizarre between the two of them. Because Moraine goes, I feel like I've taken everything from you. There's more to life than me in this mission. And Lan goes, well, before you, I didn't have any reason. I had nothing to live for or to die for. And I'm like, what? You're only the last surviving leader of Malkir, someone who literally swore to stand against the Dark One on his own if he needed to, and basically became a master at fighting him, who would even just wade into the Blight just for fun, and it almost became his second home. And yet in this, he's like, oh no, I didn't know anything. He swore an oath to stand against the Shadow so long as iron is hard and stone abides, to defend the Malkiri while one drop of blood remains, to avenge what cannot be defended. But yeah, I mean, he yeah, definitely had nothing to die for, did he? Or nothing to live for. It's not like he committed himself to a cause or anything. It's not like he literally swore to fight against the Dark One while one drop of blood literally remained on the face of the planet. No, of course he didn't. That doesn't mean anything to him. What is like literally duty is heavier than a mountain death, lighter than a feather. But no, none of this means anything. Nothing at all. Can't mean anything to anybody. No, until Moraine ended, he didn't have anything. He didn't have a cause. It's like the only reason why he swore to Moraine is because he realized that she was fighting against the Dark One, which is literally what his oath was to begin with. So he joined her because her oath matched his own. It's not like she gave him something to live for. He's just continuing what he's always lived for under her because he thought that together they'd be able to do more than he would actually on his own. That was the point. But instead, from this writer, we've got that he was literally nothing. But it was only when a woman came into his life that to actually give him meaning. It's like literally, yes, I was nothing until you took my plums away, Moraine. How sad and pathetic can you make this man? And then on his way out the door, she goes, I like her, you know, the wisdom. I'm like, well, at least somebody does, because I haven't for most of the series. So, so Lan leaves a room, and he goes off to his family, and he's walking through the city. And Lan being Lan, he thinks somebody's following him. Now, at least he actually detects people this time, because the rest of the episodes, he just keeps getting snuck up on and surprised, and doesn't even hear people whistling. But now, apparently, he can hear literally nothing, just because it fits the plot all of a sudden. And it's Nynaeve. She's stalking him. And I mean that literally in the actual definition of the word. Oh, isn't it cute when someone stalks you? No, no, it isn't. I don't know why this is happening in the plot. I don't know why now, all of a sudden, we've got characters stalking other people. But don't worry, because he's smiling, because apparently people stalking you is a great thing. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Nobody wants a stalker. Here's a tip. Don't follow people through cities. It's not a good look. But it turns out that Lan's off to meet not his family, but probably as close to a family as Lan can actually have. As his family was, uh, yeah, eaten by Trollocs. 
But of course, the stalker's stalking, and she's literally peeping through the windows at Lan and his family. And I mean, this is probably one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. I don't know why this is in the show. I don't know why this is being played off as good. And he's like, she's smiling. I don't care if you're happy, love. What you're doing is an abomination. Stop it. I mean, literally, if you didn't play this music over the top of it, and you just played creepy music over the top of it, and it's showing that window, and you're like, yeah, you're supposed, yeah, they're doing all this, but there's someone outside there stalking them. This scene has a completely different feel. So, of course, Lan knows that he's being stalked all along, and he, for this time, he's like, okay, well, I think she's seen enough. Now, she's staring through the window. She can see him in full view, and she's looking, and then, for some reason, this happens. He teleports outside. I mean, no wonder she's surprised, because I am. She's literally looking through the window at them, and apparently doesn't see him get up, leave, and then walk outside. And I don't know what she's doing or how he's done it, because she is literally turned away from the window when he's in a chair, and then he's suddenly in front of her on the left. Warders can move at super speed, but apparently they never have in the rest of the series. But in this, he's like the Flash. And she's like, hello, I was just... And he's like, following me. And she's like, yeah. I mean, so Lan goes to go back in and he says, what are you going to do? You stand there? And he literally invites her in to talk to his family. And I'm like... This is some creepy stalker's dream, this is. This is creepy stalker fan fiction. We've completely evolved from what we had in the other episodes, and it just gets worse. I don't know why it's going on. I don't know why they're doing this. I don't know why this is being put on the screen as if it's a good, cute thing to do in a relationship. Because it isn't. Don't do this. Whatever you do, don't do this. You're going to end up on some kind of list. And then he was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. He's like, no, you just plan to act like you're in some kind of creepy horror film or something. It was weird. I wouldn't mind intruding when you've actually already been invited in is the least of your issues. But then this woman walks up to her and she's like, are you hungry, Nineveh Sadai? And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry? So in the books, ageless face, it would have made sense. They just basically look like they're in their early 20s forever. Not in this, though. Now, in this, all of the Aes Sedai look as if they're in their 40s and their 50s, because they are. I mean, the only reason she could possibly assume this is if he hadn't said their name and they thought she was Moraine. But, uh they don't because they've been told a name so so the assumption is baseless and uh, it's not something you would do regularly because they were so incredibly rare i don't get it and that's only beaten by what this guy does where he grabs her arm and he goes oh thank you thank you so much for bringing my guy shan home to me and keeping him safe and i'm like okay so uh, technically in this she did i mean she's in the books but she did in this because she just went super saiyan and saved the world or something but the biggest question is how on earth this guy knows that any of that happened because they didn't have time to talk about it he didn't have time to introduce her or tell him about all the stories or the ways or anything else but somehow this guy knows this everyone's thanking her and telling her she's amazing thinking she's an as to die and thanking her for deeds that she's done but she shouldn't have been able to do but either way none of them knows about it and this entire scene is just a creation so that characters can group around and tell Nineveh how amazing she is and everyone loves her. That's literally it. This is another scene of telling Nineveh she's the bestest ever. So they walk back and they have the obvious awkward, oh, I'm outside your room, but I don't know whether I should invite you or do anything to you. So we're just going to stand here and awkwardly stare at each other for a while. And at least this isn't sort of destroying character arcs or personalities or anything else. So, it, okay, okay, this is the kind of thing I can safely ignore and not care about and it doesn't do anything else. It's not like Perrin, <laughs> so I don't mind this. But she's like, thank you for including me tonight. It's like, you didn't really give me much choice, did you? I'm like, no, I mean, well, technically she did, because if I were you, I would have had her locked up. I would have had her locked up and a restraining order taken out immediately. But apparently, no, Lan really finds this attractive. But then Lan says goodnight and just walks off. I just burst out laughing. I'm like, okay, fair play. You got me. You got me. Um, probably, I, I was like, I probably is Lan, actually. It's just like, yeah, okay, fine, fine. I mean, she literally just gets the door shut in her face. <laughs> But that's not going to stop Nineveh. I mean, you have to remember, this is a woman who literally followed him through a city against his own will. So obviously a door's not going to keep her out. At least she has the decency to go, do you want me to leave? Which is better than she did in the city. So I'm not really sure this is sending the right message about what you're supposed to do, especially the whole city scene. Um, but this is what they did. So here we are. And this is Ran being terrible at archery. And this scene would carry more weight if uh, they'd actually set it up properly and told you anything about Rand at all. They haven't told you about the flame in the void. And they haven't told you that basically Rand is an amazing archer, a perfect archer, a guy that could basically make 
any shot in the world. So because of that, uh, this could just be normal archery for a normal person. This is one of those scenes that is meant to carry weight and would carry weight if you knew all of the backstory. But if you're just a random show watcher, you'll have no idea what this means. And it's so badly set up in the series that I thought this was just them saying that Rand was bad at archery. I, even I didn't put two and two together because they haven't told us that he's meant to be something else. And I just thought that was another thing they'd changed. So Egwene comes down and she said, I waited for hours in my room for you to apologize. And I'm like, you what? You cheated on him with Perrin. Why would he need to apologize? And after all of that, Egwene apparently waited in a room for Rand to apologize and Rand is the bad guy. I don't know how Rand is the bad guy in that scenario. I don't know how anyone treats it that way. I don't know how anyone interprets that way. But apparently, that's the way you're meant to think about it. I don't know whether everything is just immediately a man's fault and they're just supposed to instantly apologize even when it's not their fault. But doing so would be ridiculous in this scenario. I don't know what Rand's supposed to have done wrong, but apparently... Uh, Rand thinks that as well. I mean, she literally walks up to him and starts folding her arms. It's like, yes, I'm your boss, don't you know? You should bow down to me, snail. I'm letting you be in my presence and you should be happy about it, no matter how I treat you. No matter how I treat you, no matter what I do to you with anybody else, none of that is your business. You should just be grateful that I allow you in my presence. I mean, the Imperial attitude is enough to turn you off alone. And this is why Egwene has rapidly become the most annoying character out of all of them in my opinion and i don't even want to have to pay attention to this but what they're doing is changing the relationship between the main characters and that matters because the relationship between them and the bonds between them will have a knock-on effect in future story plots and how they're supposed to be acting so i don't want to have to care about this or talk about this but i have to that's why i don't care about lan and Neneve, because it actually happened and so at least whatever happens in that kind of relationship will actually follow the story arc but in this they're literally just destroying the bonds between characters and ran's just there like i i found through hard one experience that when you wanted to talk you'd find me and i'm like what so you were like playing her? I was like, yes, uh, the lesson here is that she's supposed to come to you because she's the one in charge. Right, dude, right. I mean, you're not even concerned about what happened or what you found out about all of them. You're not concerned about that at all. No, you're just going to talk it through, are you? Right. I mean, considering what we find out in five minutes, you'd think he'd have a bit more self-respect. And then he apologizes to her. And I don't know why, because I don't know what he's supposed to have done wrong. But he's like, I'm sorry. And she's like, yeah, so you should be. And then he goes, I know there's nothing between you and Perrin. And I'm like, what? I mean, that's literally what was said. That was the entire conversation. That was the entire insinuation. That's what everyone talk about is. That's what everyone interpreted as. And that's why they were guilty. Why were they guilty if there's nothing going on? Why didn't they deny it if there's nothing going wrong? Why did all of them look very guilty and then only Perrin come up and say something that obviously wasn't true to you if it was actually not true? And now we're supposed to believe that that entire conversation was bad and if it was all wrong, if it was all a lie, why did Neneve feel sorry for it afterwards if none of it was true? Why did no one correct her immediately? Why was no one confused? Why was no one bewildered? Why was everyone guilty? And all of that combined is like, no, obviously nothing's going on. And then, and then her queen goes, of course there isn't. That's not even what I was mad about. And I'm like, what? Why did you look guilty? Why were you almost on the verge of tears when it was happening? I don't know what's going on. This is completely bewildering to me. At least the other stuff has just been bad writing. This is like nobody actually remembers what happened and everyone's got amnesia and I'm the only one that actually has a memory that lasts five, five seconds. I feel like I'm in that movie that's played backwards. It's completely weird to me. I don't know what's going on. I feel like I'm literally going insane making this video. But it gets worse because she's like, how dare you think that I don't care about Matt? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's because you didn't care about him much. I mean, he literally said that you weren't close to him, that you'd always felt that way. And you were like, well, he left us. So it really sounded like you didn't care about him at all. You even called him evil and said he was just going to stay behind for the dagger because he was evil. If the story is actually accurate and believe everything that all of the characters have actually told to you and that Matt is the character that they've all described, then no, you shouldn't care about him because he's just pure evil inside of him. Something that actually even Martian R was like, oh, I'll feast on that. I can eat on that for days. I don't even know what this is. No one can even keep their story straight for 30 seconds. And every time someone's on screen, they contradict what they said the last time they were on screen. Like, honestly, if it wasn't for the comments in these videos, I think I'd be the one that was going completely insane and getting everything wrong and misinterpreting everything. Because I can't even keep track of this anymore. Even within the same episode, none of it makes any sense. Like, at least normally I'd be bored in this. I'm just confused 
because everyone's saying lies to each other and we're supposed to believe they're all true simultaneously. I can't keep so many different story threads in my head at the same time that all contradict each other. Can we just please have one cohesive motivation for the characters that actually makes sense and then have them act on that? Because it seems like the characters just say whatever the writers need them to say. It's not like these characters actually exist and they're put into situations which then the character acts like themselves and that determines their response to the situation. No, in this, they're put into a situation and then the character says whatever and it doesn't need to be in any kind of relationship to, what, to what's happened before. It's not a timeline that goes from start to finish with a character development throughout that. No, a character can simultaneously be 15 different people with all 15 different personalities and everything that those 15 different personalities do don't have to actually even match with each other because what happens to one person doesn't need to happen to the same person even though it is the same person across one point in time. This isn't just a different turning of the wheel. This is like 15 different turnings of the wheel that have been put into one show and you're never told when it flips from one to another. So different things can happen in one turning of the wheel that don't need to happen in the other turning of the wheel and they don't even tell you about them but you're simultaneously but you're simultaneously supposed to believe that all of them can be simultaneously true, even though they all contradict the events which happened in all of the others. So no one gives me this, oh, it's a different turning of the wheel crap, because none of it makes sense even within their own story, let alone in comparison to what actually happened in the source material. But getting back to what she actually said, she said, how oh, dare you think I wouldn't care about him, that I wouldn't fight for him, die for him. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe it's got something to do with the fact that you literally said, oh, but what about Matt? He left us, he's evil, he went back to the dagger. Maybe that's why, personally, if I thought someone was pure evil, I wouldn't fight and die for them. I wouldn't. So I wouldn't blame her if she didn't either. But apparently now she would, even though she also thinks he's pure evil. You can't have it both ways, love. And Rand, with tears in his eyes, for the third time in the episode, although he did actually literally cry once, says, I was scared, that's why I said it. I'm like, I'm like scared. You've literally got told that your best mate was cheating on you with your future wife. I don't know why that would make you scared. I mean, we do find out what made him scared, but like anger should have been the re genuine response and anger was the response we got, but now it was out of fear. And I'm like, and all she's done is change the topic. We've moved on from the fact that her and Perrin were clearly cheating on him and even Rand's forgot that now. No, now he's apparently scared. Like not angry that he actually found out that Perrin was cheating on him <laughs> with his like future wife. No, we're supposed to forget all that. Now Rand's scared and crying for the third time in the episode. And there we go, the waterworks have started. And she's like, you won't lose me. Rain's wrong about one thing, we're coming back. And I'm like, you're clearly not because prophecy says that and prophecy is fact. And we really need to teach these characters that prophecy is literally fact. It is no mystery. It can't be disproven. It is a fact. Let's just nail that point down in the plot so that we can all move on and not have all these all oh, will it won't it stories, which literally make no sense because it doesn't actually give you any stakes. And she's like, I'm not leaving you. I've already made that mistake once. I'm like, well, <laughs> twice if you count Perrin. And Rand's like, yeah, I'll come with you. I'll be your warder. Did you think I'd let someone else be yours? And I'm like, hey, after we've seen how people treat the warders, then I'm not surprised you don't want anyone else to be it. I mean, otherwise, who's she got left? Perrin. But at this point, honestly, I wouldn't mind if Rand did become a warder, because at least then he'd be able to keep his balls in a purse, which would be a step up than having none at all. And if that happened, as long as he was actually near Egwene all the time, hey, maybe Rand actually might get screen time enough to be called one of the main characters. And then we get the obligatory, I'll always stand by you, you know that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, actions stand me in louder than words. And all you've shown us is something completely different. And then we get this scene where she just says a lot. And she's like, well, now she's crying. So it's supposed to carry an emotional impact. But she's never shown it with her actions before. So this carries no weight. Actions speak louder than words. But what we don't get in this show is actions. Because whatever happens, I'll always stand by you. No matter what happens. No matter what comes. I'm like, well, we all know in this episode, what's coming is basically everybody. Well, except Perrin. After discovering where all of Land's scars are, Nineveh has got up in the middle of the night, got dressed and is about to ghost him. Uh, yes, because what we're doing here is we're breaking down gender stereotypes and that matters. <sighs> that apparently matters. 
And what happens next is simultaneously fine with me and a complete abomination. You see, he explains to her his past, which he didn't do in the books, Moraine did, because it's not the sort of thing Lan easily shares, it's one of his most personal things. But in the show, he basically did it, and I think it was episode 4, so it's not even that big a leap, and given everything that's happened, uh, okay, I can see it happening here. I don't like how they've immediately just jumped into everything, it's not what the characters would have done. Um, but given that they already have, I can understand it. Um, but then Ninive actually goes, well, now I understand why you bonded Moraine. It was because you've got nothing, and now you belong to her. And I'm like, what? No, we've already discussed how that's not why he got a bond water bond. That's not anything to do with that. He didn't get a water bond because he had nothing and she gave him meaning. That That's nonsense. But now, if we don't just have Lan telling it to Moraine, now Ninive also takes that from his story. He literally tells her the story about his entire history, and the only thing that she gets from that is, oh, you didn't have any meaning, you poor laddie. No, you didn't have anything. That's not what the blight means to Lan. He was literally having a one-man war with the Dark One himself as just a mere mortal. And now he's, to, he's bonded to an Aes Sedai, but that's still his mission. That's the only reason for his existence. But she's just gone, oh, well, you were a puppy that didn't have a master, and now you've got a master. That's the only way she sees him. And so he's like, oh, I can't believe that you managed to listen to his entire story, and that's the only thing you get from that. And when I say I can't believe that's what Nineveh got from that, I don't actually mean that, obviously. That's what Raph got from that. Well, that's what the two female writers got from that. Throughout the entire book, and it just actually happens in the first book, you find out about this and being his history. So, okay, I'm sure so sure they've looked on the wiki so they can find out his entire history. And reading all of that, reading the impact of that, finding out about his oaths and his character and everything else, the only thing that they took from all of that is not that he was waging a one-man war against the Dark One to avenge his lost family, his lost city, and his lost kingdom. No matter what the cost, no matter who stood with him, he was going to do that until his very last breath. They didn't get any of that. They got, oh, this man has lost everything, and so without a woman to actually pledge his allegiance to, he's completely rudderless and meaningless. That literally, unless a man has pledged his allegiance to a woman, he is nothing. That's what they took from that entire story. Is it any surprise that these entire episodes turn into meaningless drivel when that is what they take from all of Lan's story? These people comprehend nothing. Although, although I do understand, given what's just happened to them, that Nineveh isn't very pleased about him being bonded to Moraine. You have to remember, Moraine can smother the bond between them. I don't think Lan can. So, uh... Unless Moraine smothered it during all of that, she felt all of that. It's gonna make any woman insecure, isn't it? <laughs> so I can actually understand Nineveh's feelings on that part and um, why she doesn't want him bonded to Moraine. And this scene, although I don't like sort of the message that she took from it, again, it's not Nineveh's fault that, that that's the message she took, that's what the writers wrote for her, but this kind of scene did make me think that actually, like, she's a lot less annoying than she was in other episodes, and this is why Egwene very quickly took over as my, the most annoying character in the series for me, and why Nineveh actually started to grow on me a bit. And then we move on to the climax of the piece, or even though previously in the episode, I think we've had several already, we have a flashback to Tam and the Trollocs. We get a flashback of Rand actually carrying Tam back to the village. Now, this really should have been in the first episode, and it needed to be because it was important. Tam is out there, and he's describing what he found. He's describing how he found Rand, how Rand was the baby, how the woman that we saw at the start of the episode is actually Rand's mother, how Rand isn't their child at all. He's actually an Aiel, which is part of the prophecy. Rand knew this from the beginning. Rand also always knew this, and to be honest, it would have meant a massive amount more to the plot and to the viewer if we'd actually known that from the start like we did in the books. Now, I said that it actually matters. I said this matters because they could have destroyed Tam. They could have had him kill that woman, and they didn't. 
which I'm grateful for. That means that Tam is now the only man who actually remains in the series who hasn't been completely destroyed. Instead, this man ran away. He found a woman giving birth and he didn't do anything to her. She died of natural causes. And so he raised the baby on his own. He was still did the best that he could. His wife wanted a baby and so he brought one back and he protected him. He was a good father figure. The only one of the show. That means that Rand is Nail. It means that Loyal saying he was Nail. Actually, the reason why it didn't carry any weight when it was mentioned, which is something I criticized, was actually because he knew all along. But we didn't know, and we should. The story didn't make sense because we should have known. I still think that's bad writing, personally, but here we are. And this is what I mean about you need to set stuff up. Now, we're supposed to suddenly know that this is a big moment for Rand, that Rand has finally accepted it. How are we supposed to know that? Well, now all of a sudden he's good at archery. Now he hits every single bullseye, which would mean something if it had ever been set up that he's supposed to hit every single bullseye to begin with. And the reason that he missed them in the first place was simply because he had a lot on his mind, simply that he was struggling with something. But because we didn't know he was, because we didn't know he was supposed to hit every bullseye in the first place, no one had actually caught on to it. But now now they're like, see, see, did you catch the twist? Did you catch the twist? It was there all along. And he's like, no, it doesn't mean anything because he didn't set it up. But now he's hitting the bullseye. And the way you're supposed to know that this is a big moment is simply that the music is that. The music is building it up. Can you feel it? Can you feel that it matters? Because the show hasn't told you it, but it is now when it's telling you via the music. This is one of those reveals where it's supposed to feel like it means something. And if you watch it the first time, it can feel like it means something. But it's the music doing all of the heavy lifting. If you actually analyze where we're ever supposed to know this, does it actually make sense if you're supposed to know this? Could it have been done better? Then trust me, it's not as good the second time through. Do you remember? The door is made of iron. See? It was meant to be him channeling. It was him channeling all along. This is a big moment, folks. This is a big moment. Oh, look, it's the power that nobody could see in the room because it was done from her perspective. But now it's from his perspective and he can see that he channeled. Yes, Rand knew all along. Oh, I'm sure if you go back, oh, there's all these little looks that Rand was supposed to know. Do you know why? Do you know that's why that's not impactful? Because Rand has been a minor character that's barely been on the screen for the entire series. None of this carries any weight because no one cares about Rand. If I hadn't known the books and known it was Rand all along, then I don't know why I'd care. I'd probably be quite angry that it was Rand, actually, because Rand hasn't done anything. Rand hasn't been a major character. Rand has been off in the corner of the screen all of the time, hidden away so that nobody could possibly think it was Rand. At this point, everyone would have thought it was everyone else because that's what they were meant to. He's been hidden away, coddled, underdeveloped the entire series, along with, actually, most of the other five. And this uh, this episode is the first time that we actually had them on screen for any severe length of time. If you'd dropped the mystery, which was never supposed to be a part of the series, if you hadn't gone, oh, I wonder who it is the entire time, then we could have actually had decently developed characters. Characters that existed on the screen for longer than two seconds. But instead, we have them hidden away, destroyed for episode after episode. We focus on Moraine for absolutely no reason for episode after episode. Tarvalen, which meant nothing, changed nothing for an entire two episodes that were completely and utterly wasted. Also, we can't actually find out anything about the characters and possibly guess this. Do you like the mystery? Do you like the mystery reveal, folks? Because this is about as good as it gets. I hope you're impressed because he's grinning because he's angry, but he's finally accepted that he is the dragon and knows what he needs to do. I mean, he's known for the rest of the seven episodes. That's why he probably got out of the camera line. He knew he shouldn't be on there just to keep the kind of mystery. He just didn't want to, he wanted to be on camera, folks. Oh, look, he said he's seen the mountain before, folks. Are you impressed? That's a callback. Do you like the callback? Like, see, I bet you didn't catch it. I bet you didn't realize this is supposed to be impressing you. But it's not like the reason that you couldn't have possibly realized is because he's out five minutes said in the entire show. It's not like he was hidden away in an inn for literally two episodes and said absolutely nothing for two episodes. He's had barely any lines. No, but out of the ten lines that he has had across the entire series, one of them was supposed to give you a hint. It's only when you actually show you again that you can possibly remember it. It's not like you're supposed to remember it because all of this is meaningless because he's barely existed on the screen. If Rand isn't a main character, then it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter which of the five is the dragon at all, and they can finally actually say it for the first time during the entire series. And the reason it doesn't matter is because no one cares about him, because you haven't given anyone time to, because you've been so busy focusing on Moraine this entire pissing time.
Oh, look, he's got three bullseyes, folks. I hope you're impressed. I mean, at this point, I don't know what someone that hasn't read the books is supposed to realize. Are you supposed to just think that now, all of a sudden, when someone realizes they're, dra they're the dragon reborn, they can actually fire arrows properly? I don't know. Maybe it's a talent coming across from the past or something, because this isn't explained. No one actually has seen that he's actually amazing at archery before. Oh, look, it was Ran that channeled and knocked the Trolloc away. I hope you're impressed. I mean, Loyal did say that you can't channel in there because it would attract the dark wind, but no one discussed whether it was the same for actually a man and a woman and whether they would both attract them or not from Sidar and Sidin, but no one's actually said those names either, so we actually still don't know if there's two halves of the power or whether it is literally just meant the men that make it filthy like the Red Ajar has said all along. So here's your big reveal, folks. Despite the fact that we haven't even actually established the basic foundational principles of how the power works, despite the fact that the ways are literally from the taint itself, and that's pretty important because it matters whether actually because the ways is made of the taint and the dark wind is made of the taint, whether it's actually attracted to or repulsed by, because you think it'd kind of work like magnets, right? That one side would repulse the dark wind, whereas the other one would attract. I don't know. Maybe that's why Nineveh actually scared it away because she's using the female half of the power, Sidar, and so that repulsed the Black Wind, whereas Rand, using Sidin, attracted it. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the rules of how the ways work, and why Nineveh could actually repulse it that way by just a random outburst of pure force that isn't in any kind of weave. Maybe that's what the writers were going for, but I don't know, because they haven't given us any foundational rules of this entire world throughout the entire series, and so no one can make judgments on it at all, or even speculate about it, and all we can do is say, well, you probably got this wrong, but you might not, because in the future you'll go back and say something different and show something different that no one was supposed to know. I don't know, because none of this makes any sense anymore, and I'm fed up with trying to pretend that it does. And, and then we get to the Black Wind itself, where it's just like, oh, it's you. You're the Dragon Reborn. You've known it all along. And I'm like, I'm not really sure that's a taunt. I mean, even for a YouTube comment, calling someone the Dragon Reborn, I'm not sure if it's many major taunt it's meant to be. Especially with how he reacted to it. I mean, yeah, so one ha on the one hand, he is also actually going to basically have to sacrifice his entire life to do whatever's needed. And it's probably going to end up getting him crushed on the meantime. But on the other hand, uh, if he doesn't do that, the apocalypse is going to happen. But either way, he goes to see Min and Min's like, oh, it's you. He's like, do you know I'm coming? She's like, yeah, it kind of comes with the territory. I'm like, no, it's not. It's not. That's not how your power works. Uh, you see pictures of major events in the pattern and it floats around them. You don't just see the future. You can't predict everything. You can't tell him what he's going to order at the bar tomorrow. That's not how any of this works. And saying it is makes her power seem simultaneously like stronger and also just more petty. So she's like, what do you want? He says, I want you to tell me you're not the dragon reborn. And she goes, okay, you're not the dragon reborn. I'm like, oh, great, great. I mean, he's literally finding out something that's literally crushing his entire world. But yeah, what he really needs is some flippant woman saying that to him. Grace, thanks. What I really needed at this point was dad jokes. And he's like, I didn't need you to protect my feelings. She's like, I don't even care about how you feel, which literally doesn't make any sense given what everybody knows. But okay, okay. There are some times in a series where it's possible to have terrible script writing, but no one can actually talk about the terrible script writing because you can't say what's supposed to happen in the future. And you're not actually sure at this point whether it's actually bad script writing or whether they're just going to change that as well. So here we are. Here we go. We're just going to skip over this. This isn't the first time it's happened either. And sometimes I wonder if it's done deliberately. <laughs> I'm like, oh yes, aren't men so horrible? I think that's the message that we can definitely get from this scene. Which is also the message we've got from 99% of the other scenes. So please, Raph, please at some point can we just change the record? And finally we get down to the actual scene. Now she stopped being sarcastic for once in her life. And believe me, I should know something about that. And she's like, look, I know who you are. And she's like, look me in the eye and tell me you want to know. Because once you know, there's no going back. And I like to be honest, you saying that has literally confirmed everything to him, so it's already too late. Whether he wanted to know or not, now he knows. So, um, everything you've just said is pointless. Cheers. She says it was the first vision she ever had, and she saw a man in armor carrying the Heromart blade and a baby. And then we finally go back to the start of the episode. Although at this point, if you haven't put two and two together, then I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, most of the rest of the episode doesn't make any sense, but at least this did. You see, they actually saved Tammy. Could have easily pushed forwards that with that blade, but he didn't. He helped to deliver the baby. Now, she does deliver the baby in three pushes and then immediately dies. So it's not the best. But on the other hand, as I said at the start of this, 
me and Raph, we know something, and apparently there's no pain. It's so easy giving birth. It's easy. There's no pain at all. I don't know what the fuss is about. I really don't. Raph wants everyone to know that it's all just fine. You can just do it in three pushes after you. As long as you've, as long as you've actually fought 17 men, and you know, you've got yourself a bit loose and relaxed, then it's probably going to be fine and easy. And it's over in about four seconds. It's awesome, really. But Tam delivered the baby, and that baby was Rand. And he took him back to his wife, and they looked after him, and raised him, and cared for him. And it's great because now Tam is an actual good father figure. I don't know whether that's going to last in the future. They might realize that that's actually what they've turned Tam into and want to destroy him, but we'll see and we'll handle that when it comes. He's like, do you see anything around me now? And she says rainbows and carnivals and three beautiful women. I'm like, calm down, love. Now is not the time to chat him up. Although I think that smile says it all. You have to remember this guy's life is unraveling before his eyes. He's just realized he's going to have to sacrifice himself to save the world. But hey, he gets three beautiful women, and that's enough for Rand. Because that smile is something that says, hey, there's two others. God, I can finally get a Vegwin. Like, after how she's treated him throughout this entire series, no wonder he's grinning. I'd be grinning like a Cheshire cat, too. So he asks her, do you see the eye of the world? And she said, I wish I didn't. And he says, why? Because you seem like a good person. And he says, do you make it? Do I make it back? And then what happens next is bizarre. She just gets up and walks off. Doesn't even answer him. And he just goes, oh, oh I didn't think so. And I'm like, I'm sorry, because there's two options. Either he lives or he dies. And if he lives, then they've just completely disproved this entire prophecy. And if they destroyed prophecy, then they've basically destroyed the entire world because the entire world relies on prophecy and prophecy is fact. No matter what Raph or anyone else says, including the writers, that's the foundational principle of the entire world. So either they destroy the foundation of the entire world and she's wrong, or they do the cheapest trick in the entire world and go, well, she never actually told him and maybe she was just leading him on and she just didn't want to actually tell him he'd survive, which if she did, then literally that's horrible. Because if you know someone's going to survive, then you can at least reassure them. <laughs> So either he dies, which doesn't seem likely because there's a season two, or he lives and prophecy's wrong, or she's a cow. Pick one, folks, pick one. I think they're all horrible. I think they're all equally horrible. So now he walks off and he genuinely thinks he's going to die because he's literally been told by someone that sees the future. Great. So then Egwene goes into Nineveh's chambers, finds the beds unmade, and is really happy that she's got her end away. Nineveh comes back and does the walk of shame, but apparently Egwene's really pleased about it. Perrin comes in and it's all very awkward and no one wants to talk about the fact that everyone thinks he's cheating on her even though apparently they're not cheating on her even though they said they're cheating on her and no one actually wanted to say they wasn't cheating on her and it's all just still a disgusting plot point that doesn't make any sense and I wish it didn't exist. But they all decide that they actually want to go to the eye of the world and they've actually made their mind up they're all going. But it doesn't matter because Rand goes to Moraine and he says I'm the dragon reborn and we just need to go because if I we go then I can save my friends because they don't go there they're not going to die because then only I'll actually survive and I'll go and fight but I think I'm going to die there as well so it's horrible but at least they won't and I'll do anything for them because I don't want any of them to die so at least he's being selfless and a man and protecting people. Which is basically the first time in the entire series. Now that Rand's actually a main character, we actually get some good plot points. Can we keep on with this? Can we actually not hide away our main characters anymore? Please? So Lan realizes that his bond's been masked again. This is gonna probably gonna become a recurring plot point whenever they actually need it to because it's useful. And then he was like, I don't understand. And then everyone realizes was Rand isn't there. And that means that Rand and Moraine have actually gone off. And then they suddenly realize that now he's the dragon reborn. Of course, they realize this at the same time, but it's not like Tarwin Gap's far away. They could probably get on a horse and come over here. They're only about 100 meters away, but this is the blight. And honestly, I don't like it. I don't like it. It just looks like trees, and it's not how I imagined the blight at all. And like I said, that I don't really focus on description. I just come up with something in my head, but... I don't think this is what it's meant to be at all, is it? If it is, then my imagination was completely and utterly wrong. But also, I just don't like it either way. Even if this was 100% accurate to the books, I don't like it. I don't like the blight being a tree that slowly grows across the earth. So I don't know if it's me, and I'm going to have to go and look it up. And I haven't looked it up, but either way, my initial reaction is just... Ugh. I think that sums up my reaction to this. But either way, Rand and Moraine enter. They've got a day's journey to go through to get to the either world, and that will be the next episode. 
Now, the way I make these videos is I have notes and then I go through the show. But in this, I didn't even refer to my notes that much. I just kind of went through the show because there's so much that was awful that I had enough to deal with as it was without going through very detailed notes, which actually hark back to the books and previous other things because there was already too much to talk about. And I cut out a lot as it was. Like with Min and the Vision, you've got Rand and three beautiful women, but also a rainbow. And now we've seen in an earlier discussion what happens to warders and people that get bonded and how they can actually take on the emotions of other people for other people. And Raph has actually spoken about how uh, actually there are going to be various different sort of open relationships in the show. So Rand could get with three women who also have relationships with other people. Other men. And there's a rainbow. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Because this could get very, very interesting and really stray off the books. Especially if all of this random relationship drama just keeps on. And let's face it, for the shippers, it's going to keep on. So there was so much drivel put into this and so much to discuss. Uh, going but too far and being all like, oh, are they going to discuss this? Is this a reference to this? Just felt like it's going too far off the beaten trail. Even though I kind of feel like what I've done is a bit like what the showrunners have done. I feel like you've included a load of crap and actually cut out what was a load of interesting conversation just because it's too long in the first place. But I need to because it affects it. I don't want to talk about the whole scene in the kitchen with Nineveh and everyone else and how actually Nineveh actually went into the bedroom and went, oh, I'm sorry for stirring things up. And I like stirring what up? The truth. The truth about what's actually been going on in front of Ran that you thought Ran shouldn't know, even though he had every right to know what was going on. I don't want to talk about that entire thing because it actually destroys the relationship between Rand and Perrin, people who are supposed to be close. People are supposed to have each other's backs and now they can't because look what Perrin's doing. Perrin's been keeping that all along and now not only has had a wife, which he literally killed, now he's been basically betraying her during the entire marriage as well. I think the entire episode of this was disgusting. I think the reveal was awful and I think this season has really suffered for it. I know they think that was a great reveal. I know they think that was so important, but it wasn't important enough to destroy all of your previous episodes. That reveal wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth all of the wasted episodes we had before. So we cut out massive amounts of character development and just had pointless episodes in Tar Valen, which basically could have been cut and we had nothing useful in them. We didn't need to spend a load of time on a useless warder when we could have had our main characters. But the reason we didn't have our main characters is because you wanted this mystery going through through episode after episode of just, oh, who is it? Will they, won't they? I don't know. It could be any of them. It better not put Rand on the screen just in case anyone realizes it's him. So we spent two episodes doing nothing in an inn just so nobody suspected him. It's not worth it. And now Rand has finally been revealed. Does anybody care? Because they got a load of people who knew all along who's like, why isn't Rand on the screen? Rand should really be on the screen. He's the main character after all. And you had the other people who hasn't seen Rand, so won't care about Rand, who now realize that he's the Dragon Reborn. And now they're like, why is it him? He's useless. I know nothing about him. So while there are stuff that I appreciate in this episode, by the fact that actually the main characters are on the screen for more than five seconds for the f literally the first time ever, so I like that, all of it feels kind of ruined. And even then, I don't like what they've done on the relationship drama and it's not necessary when we can have other stuff introduced. And that's without even going into what they've done with Aglemar and everyone else. Completely just taking his name, sticking it on a different person and calling it the same person. He didn't act like that. He was very respectful. And it does matter. So we end up with a show that continues the themes of the others. It treats the men like crap. It literally tells them that they only exist to submit to a woman. And actually, that woman owns you. Like, literally, you belong to her. The word means you belong to her. And you actually don't have any meaning in your life at all until you belong to one. Like, literally, the men are property. And you know why? because we're subverting the normal social stereotypes. That's what it is, because that's the way that's the way that they see marriage. That's the way they've always seen traditional marriage. And so now, <laughs> how do you feel like we're doing it to the men? It's so basic, it's so obvious, and it doesn't make for a good script. It doesn't make for good writing. But you know what would have done? The source material that's been ignored and destroyed this entire time. All so we can get this. I said in a previous video, I felt like I needed a gender studies degree. 
But I'm even past that now. This is full PhD territory, except it's not even good. I think episode 6 was my best review of the show, but the reason it was is because there was so much to laugh at. But in this, I don't even think there is, because this is just blind destruction of character after character, trope after trope. Oh, we're going to subvert everything. Oh, here's the big reveal. And all of it was meant to just hide who the reveal was all along. And then it had the nerve to come back and go, see, we put it in the show on, we clever and revel in it. And I'm like, no. No, you can't produce a show like this and then expect people to be impressed by what you've done. If you'd built a good show up to this and then revealed it anyway, then it could have been appreciated. But when you hide him away and make him do nothing and crap on run the entire way and then go, ha ha, aren't we clever? You didn't realize. It's like, no, you, no, you did it the lazy man's way. And to know that all of this was done, aging of the characters was all done so we can have something as useless as that scene in the kitchen. Just a random triangle just comes out of nowhere because every other show has it, and so we need to too. And it's like, no, because this show could have stood on its own. It had the quality of stuff, it had the quality of plot on its own already made for you, and you've ignored it and replaced it with something that everything else does. And no, we didn't need that. There's a reason why you bought this property. There's a reason why this is literally one of the largest fantasy series of all time. And it's because people liked what it was. It was because it was strong. And it didn't need something that some two-bit hack of a show, which is just an original IP that had been put on the CW for seven years. It didn't need what that show does. This isn't like there are certain things that a TV show needs that a book series doesn't. No, no. No. You have to choose at some point who you want to appeal to, and they've chosen to appeal to, basically, Tumblr. And I don't know if you've paid any att attention recently, but Tumblr doesn't exist. And the reason Tumblr doesn't exist is because it didn't have enough people to be profitable. And so, I don't know, maybe I'm a fool, but if I was them, what I would choose is not to go for the source material of the people of Tumblr, which literally got an entire website shut down. I would go for the source material that made one of the largest fantasy series of all time. Because if you can do what that show did, if you can keep those fans happy, then the odds are you're going to keep everyone else happy as well. Because there's a reason that not everyone read the books because not everyone likes reading. But people are watching your TV series because they like watching TV series. So the only thing you had to do is take the quality of what people liked when they read and put it on the screen. That's how you appeal to everybody. Because people that love the books will also love TV series, but not necessarily the other way around. But instead, you didn't do that. You took a generic TV series and put the Wheel of Time name all over it. You got characters which don't exist and took names of characters from the books and put them on and everyone's supposed to accept it. But it's all literally so you can go for trope after trope after trope. And the weird thing is, I know you think you're breaking stereotypes. I know you think you're going against the grain. And I know you think that's why, oh, we're going to make the men cry and we're going to have these people do this and we're going to go across this and we can't do this. But all you've done is fill your show full of stereotypes. The whole Aegilmar thing is a stereotype. Moraine's reaction to it is a trope. Oh, look, here's the man in power who thinks he knows everything, but the really strong woman stands up to him and says, if you'll let me finish, and then she comes out with something really witty and insightful and tells him something he didn't know, and then he completely changes his persona and realizes that actually, I should have listened to the woman after all. Certainly that is not a generic trope that you can find online anywhere just talking about a business meeting. Like literally all that is is one of the writers and it's their pet bugbear that they're not listened to more at the office. That is literally what that is and we all had to sit through it and think it was quality writing. So she destroyed the books just to put down one of her personal pet peeves. And I'm supposed to be pleased with that. I'm supposed to be pleased with that in the Wheel of Time. I've had the Wheel of Time destroyed so that someone can complain about The Office for £10 million an episode. 
So you'll have to forgive me if I'm not pleased. You'll have to forgive me if I'm not in my normal jovial mood where I can laugh at it. Because this was an abomination. This was the worst thing that he could possibly have done. And I, even though he's got what is literally one of the climaxes of the show, even though everyone probably knew it all belonged, at least they would have done if it had been properly written. I can't even think, okay, I enjoyed that. Why? Because of all of the other climaxes that had to be forced into the show at the same time for absolutely no reason that contribute nothing. So welcome to it all and welcome to hell. I've had to sit through it and now so have you. I don't know if this has been entertaining or not or whether it's all been an abomination to watch this video because quite frankly I've gone so far along I've lost all kind of sense of taste at this point. I've been making this video for a long time and I have absolutely no idea what it's going to turn out like. But here we are. If you liked it, press like. Subscribe for more videos like this in the future because there's one more episode. And at this point, they've got a very steady, long, repeated, predictable path of taking everything to hell and making everything worse at every opportunity. Every single choice they have made that has strayed from the books has been an abomination, has made it objectively worse, and they have gone far along expecting this to ever improve. So here we are. Welcome to the finale. Can it get any worse? I think the answer can only be yes. <sighs> oh. Have mercy on us all.